welcome all. Welcome all in this time frame, in the time frame to come, in the time frame that has passed. Most importantly, I welcome you all in those other universes. There is something that indeed is most important for us to celebrate, as you well know. And so I will start with that because that's where I stand and that's where I feel most joyful at. Where that is, is yes, we have a new president elect and a new vice president elect, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And so I congratulate them and I encourage you all joining us to do the same and wish them hyperspeed in moving forward with a more hopeful uh, future and uh, agenda uh, for all of us as we move over the course of the next four years and beyond. As I shared with Chip just a short while ago, it was sort of quiet on my street. So right after, <laughs> just like it was on your street <laughs> as well, Chip, uh, last night. So I had some fireworks left over and I went out on the street. I lit those and I have a very loud cowbell. And so I got to ringing that. So I couldn't be in downtown Washington, DC, where I'm originally from. And I certainly was not in Durham, which I like to hang out in and used to work in as well. So right here in my neighborhood on my street, I lit fireworks and made enough noise to bring my neighbors to their doors and to their windows. And most of them were quite grateful for having such a celebration. That all having been said, we move into the program, Afrofuturism Afro and Black Speculative Arts. I want to again thank Kim McMillan for reaching out to me for us to work together to make this happen. Uh, I want to especially thank all of those folks with the technical input and savvy, especially Chris, uh, who are making this happen as we speak and view one another. And then finally, uh, I want to thank our past panel from just last month, uh, which consisted of Ishmael Reed, Ronaldo Anderson, Cherie Renee, Thomas, and uh, Kenitra Brooks. So today, in two separate blocks, we will be engaging Afrofuturism from whole new perspectives. And the first block will consist of Samuel Chip Delaney, who has been writing for over a half century plus. He's probably more closer to three quarters of a century in his writing. But certainly my first encounter with his work was in the 60s. Um, and I just pulled out several of those. I will engage that discussion shortly. But after our discussion on the first block panel with Chip Delaney, I will move to engaging Ayana, no, Eugene Redmond, uh, who should be joining us shortly. Uh, out, uh, he is the poet laureate of East St. Louis, Illinois, among other grand things, followed up by Ayana Jameson, who is with us from the West Coast, and who is uh, remarkable in so many ways, but especially her connectedness and oversight and sustaining and advancing the legacy of uh, Octavia Butler. And then finally, uh, Dr. Glenn Paris, who is the author of the volume Dragon's Air. The second block will consist of uh, three other panelists. Uh, first on that panel, uh, I will be engaging uh, Sister Avacha. And Avacha, I am going to refrain until you can give me the heads up on pronouncing your last name correctly but you will kick off the second block panel, of course, um, followed uh, by, um, and I don't see you here, are you with us? Well, in that second panel, we have Hope uh, Wabuki Kenyon, am I correct? 
And we also have on that panel, uh, let me make sure I look at all of my notes. How could I forget you, Grace, since you're the closest to me, because you're right up in Virginia, Grace Gibson, uh, who is at Virginia Commonwealth University. But needless to say, and, and, and more importantly, let's move forward. Uh, let's move forward in this discussion uh, with uh, our grand scholar, grand intellect, grand uh, engager in all things that have advanced the discussion and discourse around the speculative, around science fiction, around identity, around literature. Uh, you know, I and so many others, uh, as I bring you on, Chip, um, have really uh, enjoyed the consistent postings that you share on Facebook uh, that immerse us in the literary, but more importantly, immerse us in you and, and, and your genealogy, your heritage, your family. Um, I being here in North Carolina am right outside Raleigh. And so I can pull up stacks and stacks of books here of yours. <laughs> yes. <laughs> On top of this one is Atlantis, Three Tales, followed by Einstein Intersection. But it's Atlantis that's important for how we'll kick off the discussion in, in certain regards, because it's there that you share with us an aspect of your family. And your family uh, is important. And I know this is an added question, but it, in reading Atlantis initially, no idea except the relationship I could make to it with the fact that I'm in North Carolina and it opens up with a train moving to New York. And so I wanted to ask you first, because uh, this is a fresh question, the other three I sent to you. But this one, you're embracing your family and their significance in the ways that you do on Facebook, but especially in Atlantis. Um, that seems to be very important to you right now since we're seeing all these posts and pictures of your family and we're enjoying it so, so much so that I wanted to just ask you, um, would you consider the fact that this is a whole new genre of writing because it's it's almost like memoir, but it's also fictional. And what you post on Facebook gives us so much of a grand tour of Harlem. Uh, hold on, hold on. You need to be unmuted. Could you unmute uh, Chip's microphone, please? And you might want to try to unmute it yourself, Chip, as well. No. Okay. There oh, we go. Okay. There we go. All righty. So after all of that was said and done. Okay. I got your there? question. I got your. I got your question. Um, Atlantis is a Atlantis is a book that um, um, I'm very fond of. It's a book I worked very, very hard on. It was a, took a long time to write. I mean, given the fact just, and I'm talking just about the first, it's three stories in the book. And the first story took me practically a year to write. Um, and, one of the, one, and, and one of the problems with the book in terms of being accurate is that it's based on a lot of family stories and family stories about the Delaney's, about the Delaney half of the, the, um, um, the family. Not, um, the, there's my mother's side, which is the Boyd family, and then there's my father's side, which is the Delaney half. But one of the problems was simply that the stories often came not from the Delaney's themselves, but from the Boyd's. And they simply had some of them wrong, some of the facts wrong. Uh, because it, and this, as, as soon as it gets away from the people that it's actually about. So uh, just little things like the opening of Birth of a Nation, which is one of the 
incident, the, the film, uh, the, the, the film Birth of a Nation, which mm -hmm. one of, the, one of the, the, the things there's always been a family story about. Um, but um, one of the things that happened in the book is that the, that, um, the original opening of Birth, Birth of a Nation, which I believe was in 1914, gets confused with the re-release of Birth of a Nation in 1925. Uh, and and so um, that's just one of the one of the things that's that's not accurate in the film uh, uh, and what was supposed to have gone on there. Uh, but other things like the characters of um, um, uh, my my aunt my aunt Clarice, my aunt Clarice um, Delaney, who was a young poet who who died very early at at, at age twenty six. Uh, from um, um, what was probably a combination of leukemia and tuberculosis, although they don't really know for sure at this point. Uh, and she was a graduate of Wellesley, where I spoke not too long ago. Uh, but I found and found out and, and uh, found out that I, th I thought they would have more of her papers, which is what I'd been where I'd been told by someone in the family to go look for them. Uh, and it turned out that they didn't have them. And just things like that, although there are a couple of poems of hers in a, a very famous anthology called Caroling, D Caroling Dusk by County Cullen. Uh, so, so there are, so although it's a good, it's a, I'm, I'm still proud of it as a story. It is a story and it's mostly fictional rather than, uh, rather it can't be considered at all, at all historical except uh, some of the ones that you can actually check in, uh, you know, you can actually check in, uh, in, in books. So I would say that about is what, what I can say quickly about Atlantis. Although if you just flip through it, uh, Look at the, the the way the text is laid out on the page. You'll realize that it is an experimental story. There are here and there are there are two columns running at the same time. There are little textual inserts all through it, uh, and things like that do make it more experimental than not. Yeah, we 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 think so much about Afrofuturism and science fiction. Uh, the, in Atlantis, I, let me just add quickly. There's nothing science fictional about it. Right, exactly. Uh, with, with, with what you you have done so much so, uh, because of the fact that with so many books, like we can certainly go to Straits of Messina, or we certainly could go to Tales of Never Yawn, Silent Interviews, is there is the fiction. There is the science fiction. There is the memoir. There is the essays. Uh, what I want to go to is the fact that there were a host of stories uh, written in the 60s, novels, as I reach up here and grab. What I always love were these ace doubles, where you got two stories in one. And so right. I'm actually holding the ballad <laughs> of Beta 2. Uh, but then I'm holding a reprint edition. I couldn't find my original copy of The Jewels of After. Um, and these are earlier works of yours, but the work I want to bring into discussion is the uh, Fall of the Towers, uh, the trilogy. And you chose to write a trilogy. Uh, certainly N.K. Jemison has written a trilogy. Octavia Butler with the Xenogenesis Suite has written a trilogy. What was it for you? or? Maybe even what is it for any author to choose that form relative to writing, especially within the case of science fiction? Well, certainly I can talk about the early days of science fiction when uh, a lot of science fiction came out, as did much of mine, as paperback originals. Uh, there was kind of a limit on the length that the books could be. Uh, so a book like The Fall of the Towers, which I originally conceived as three volumes, uh, uh, was um, I wanted to write something that was longer, uh, that and and that couldn't simply it couldn't fit in to one of the short books like the ba Ballad of Beta Two, which you held up, or on the other side of it uh, was um, uh, what was it? Was it the Tree Lords of Imoten? 
Uh, well, this is uh, why was it? Um, Alpha, Alpha, yes. Alpha, Second yes. Chair, no. no, yes, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, so it was a way. Uh, for one thing, it was a way of doing something that was longer, and that started back uh, with, of all people, with Isaac, at least that I know of, started back with Isaac Asimov in his foundation books, who wanted to do the same thing in the initial publication of those, uh, and to do something that was longer and more massive. Uh, and so that's what, what you did. If you wanted to do something that was going to take more, more pages, uh, you simply wrote, you know, you wrote something that would go over three volumes. Eventually, when I got to do a book called Dahlgren, um, that had shifted. And the a book uh, a company like Bantam Books could actually do a longer, uh, a longer work. It was a lot, uh, so it was kind of a technological restraint uh, initially, uh, and eventually even Ace Books published an edition of the Fall of the Tower of the uh, Fall of the Towers, which is the overall name for the book I had originally conceived, and it was the first name I conceived for it. Uh, that, uh, and that's, as I said, that this is, uh, this is the current edition of the Fall of the Towers. Uh, I notice it's backwards. Uh, <laughs> and that's not, because of our technology. Not for, not for us. Not no, it is. Oh, it isn't. Okay, it is for me uh, on, on my TV screen. I'm glad you could, guys could read it properly. Um, but it's, this is, so this was conceived of as one book. It's relatively thick. But it originally came out in um, uh, two um, two double-sided books, like *The Ballad of Beta Two, and then one single, one small single book, and then eventually uh, they uh, printed it. Uh, the same publishing company, when the technology got a little different, uh, printed a couple of editions of it under the title *Fall of the Towers* in one volume, uh, and uh, so there, there, there you go. That was, and I think that probably obtained as through um, Octavia, by the time Octavia was writing, uh, started writing, although it very quickly changed. Uh, they eventually, they could do it longer. And one of the things they discovered, of course, is that the, 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 the readership, once they got used to it, wanted the longer books. And yeah. so, it's like, well, you know, that's what they wanted. So a book like Dahlgren actually sold surprisingly well uh, and much better than anything I had done up until that time. Although the earlier books used to sell much better than books do today. Um, something like the, the, when I got my first report now on, on, the, on the Jewels of Aptor, uh, which was another double book, uh, which was, uh, which had a, a you know, a, a, I don't, remember what was on the other side of the Jewels of Actor right offhand. Uh, but it was, um, it may have been something by a man, by, uh, by a man named John Brunner, an English writer who was writing under the name of Keith Woodcott. Uh, nevertheless, um, it was, um, it, it sold something like 98,000 copies, uh, which was considered, um, you know, very ordinary. It wasn't considered, you know, it wasn't considered, that was what, that was, that was, that was, con that wasn't considered, uh, that wasn't for a paperback, uh, uh, best, uh, be for a paperback double book, that was not a bestseller by any means, by anybody's notion of a bestseller. Although I think most people would be very happy to sell to, to most first writers, first, first novelists today would be quite happy. Uh, to sell 98,000 copies in any edition uh, that they got published, you know. But this shit tells you how the world itself has changed since, in that case, 1961, which is 1961 or 62. Uh, I think um, that I'm, I'm not sure which year it came out. It either came out at the end of 1961 or the beginning of 1962. Okay. So you spoke just now, of the world changing. And so the term Afrofuturism, you know, was in introduced, as we know, in the 90s, and certainly mm -hmm. it was a discussion, uh, you with Mark Deary. And yes. there have been other definitions that have ensued since that time. I guess, you know, the, the, the key question is, is the term relevant now? 
And do you see growth regarding African American black audiences and writers in science fiction? Well, there's certain, there, there, first of all, there are so many more of us. And that is, I think, is a great thing because there weren't. Um, I, I had the dubious distinction of being the first, um, it, first um, black science fiction writer to come up through the traditional, um, what would you call it, the, the, the traditional machinery of commercial science fiction. Now, there were people who wrote in the field before who did not come up through that field. Edward Bellamy, um, uh, a, 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 a Jamaican writer, um, what was his name, uh, who wrote The Purple Cloud, M.P. Scheel, uh, who was also probably, uh, you came from Jamaica, and so was probably um, was, you know, had, was fairly black. <laughs> but we don't know. We don't know for sure. We do have pictures of them. We don't know. Uh, but anyway, and then and several others. Um, so um, uh, it, um, but the commercial, what, but what we think of today as science fiction, which started in the, what, uh, uh, with Hugo Gernsback uh, in the 30, 20s or 30s, um, that didn't get started until then. That was uh, with, the, with the magazines and then the, the paperback books. Um, that is a, you know, that's, that's a, that's, um, that's um, a particular, that's, a, that's, that's what most of us think of today as science fiction. Uh, in fact, often I, I, I wonder, I, I, I wonder about using the, the term science fiction um, mm -hmm. for work published before then. I think it's kind of misleading. Uh, there's a, something, there's a, there's a, a tendency for people to say any kind of imaginative fiction that was written at all must be somehow science fiction, so that Gulliver's Travels is somehow science fiction, which I think is silly, uh, because they, they, uh, it, it was just not conceived of, and it was a, and, and it was a, a product, it was just, it was, it was a, a fantasy and an allegory. Uh, which I think is, you know, which were terms that could have been used at the time it was written. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, but that's, that's the way that works. And so I, 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 I've always been, I, I've liked holding science fiction to, uh, especially to, you know, American fiction um, published in a particular um, with, a, when I say machinery, machinery is in some ways is, um, is machinery in some ways a metaphor, and in some ways I mean literally certain kinds of machines were available, like typewriters and a linotype machine and, uh, and the various machines on which the uh, material was presented, printed. When my books were first printed, most of the typesetting uh, was done by high school students in Kingston, New York. That's how they, they and the, 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 the manuscripts were sent up to them, and they, working after school, they would retype the manuscripts. You know, mm -hmm. people are just completely unaware, and, and the result was there were a fair number of, of uh, um, what's the word I'm looking at, were, were for typographical errors that snuck in, uh, mm -hmm. and all sorts of things like that. But there's a, there's a whole... Um, Mysterious side. We don't. We don't. We don't know what the race of many of those Kingston students were, but the chances are are they were probably white, mm -hmm. uh, and we don't know how they were being dealt with. Uh, do we know how much they were paid? Huh? And nor do we know what. Nor do we know what they were paid. Yeah. Uh, when I started writing, um, my four-room apartment in the East Village, when we, when myself and my then wife, uh, a poet named Marilyn Hacker, um, rented the, the the apartment, uh, it was um, fifty-eight dollars a month, uh, and we brought the city inspector in to look at it because we thought that was a little high. And the city inspector said, "Oh no, that's much too much for this apartment, uh, given the shape it was in." Uh, and they brought it down to fifty-two dollars a month. You know, by the you know, and the it was the la and became uh, people that the landlord really didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> Do we call that term Afrofuturism 
is it relevant? Is it Afrofuturism as a term relevant now? I think it is. I think it is, but I think it's become that, although you, I think you have to remember it is not, you know, Mark Deary was as white as they get. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, uh, it, it was not invented, it was not invented by a black writer. Mm -hmm. It was invented by a white writer who thought it would be interesting simply because there was these kinds of differences and kinds of differences in the concerns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we have, of course, Ronaldo Anderson and, and others who've advanced the notion of black speculative arts. Yeah, as mm -hmm. and spe speculative fiction, speculative art is another one of those I claim. And spe who came up with the term speculative fiction? Where does it start? Anybody want to guess? It's Robert Heinlein, mm -hmm. you know, who has been dismissed as a fascist many times. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, uh, and it was brought in by some English writers, uh, most of whom I think when they took the term over had, had forgotten that he was the person who had initially uh, uh, instituted the terms. You know, there's a, 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 a piece, a literary piece that I'm, I'm very, I like very much, uh, which is uh, Thomas Brown's Urn Burial. It says, who has the oracle of his bones? Who is going to know where your bones are going to end up after you die? Uh, and the point is, who's going to know where your words end up after you die as well? Which words are going to be taken? Who they're going to be taken, who they're going to be taken by? Are they going to end up being uh, an English term or are they going to be an American term? Speculative fiction was basically, and uh, was, was Heinlein was an American as they could get. A few English writers took over and popularized the term speculative fiction with a magazine called New Worlds. It was led by Robert, uh, but was led by uh, uh, Michael Moorcock. It was edited by uh, the young Michael Moorcock. And then it moved back over. Uh, I don't, I've never been particularly fond of the term speculative fiction, although I used it for about four years. And then I decided it was too much of a neologism, just went back to science fiction uh, and, uh, or, you know, or the various things that speculative fiction could include, which was basically speculative fiction initially meant when the uh, New World's writers used it in England, basically it meant what would today we would call science fiction, fantasy, or experimental fiction of any sort, of any kind. And then I thought, well, that's too broad. Why don't we just say science fiction, fantasy, or experimental fiction uh, instead of trying to lump them all together? I think the idea of experimental fiction uh, has probably dropped out of most people's sense of what speculative fiction is, although I'm not sure. Maybe there are some people who still feel that way. But that's, you know, that's, there you go. So why did you go? Natasha Womack, with her book, of course, Afrofuturism, she adds within that context, because she talks about the whole notion of the embrace of the future, technology, and creativity. And then she adds one more very key word that truly does expand the definition. She adds and liberation. Mm -hmm. Her definition. And yeah. Yeah. adding that, it opens the door to a certain activism around creative productivity. And I think within that context, um, there, is, there is something to be said for uh, all of those newer folks you speak of that have now joined the fray. And right there in Philadelphia, you have uh, Rashida Phillips and others who've, you know, embraced using science fiction as a certain... Uh, workshopping methodology for young people and others within marginalized communities to uh, engage in visioning. And so I guess in that context, it has a whole new vitality. Right. The, the other thing about, if, if it's worthwhile going back to Mark Deary's uh, uh, original article, one of the people he included in that, and I think most people would be a little you know, unless they looked at the article, one of his Afrofuturists was uh, William Gibson, who was a white writer, mm -hmm. born, hmm? who was a white writer, mm -hmm. very popular for a, for a while, and still is, I think, who was born in Alabama. Mm -hmm. 
And basically, uh, and he's a great guy, he's a great guy. He was a student of mine at one point, just as Octavia was uh, at another point. Uh, but uh, one of the things about him uh, is that he, every, he wrote about, every once in a while, he wrote about black characters. And the initial notion of Afrofuturism was not where you came, where, what your own background was. It was whether you ever wrote about black characters or not. So I went with that, and so I've talked about even a, one of my favorite writers, uh, Theodore Sturgeon, who actually has one, not a lot, but every once in a while he talks about characters who are either definitely black, as in his novel More Than Human, or who certainly could have been black. Uh, that is, um, now uh, in More Than Human, there is a kid who is an, an orphan, who is a, a, a who is described a couple of times? He's black-haired. His name is Jerry. Nobody knows what his last name is. Uh, and there's another character who was born. Um, we don't know. He's an idiot, and the, he he names the first uh, the the first third of the novel is called the fabulous idiot, uh, and um, named Lone. And and more than human, I think is an amazingly good novel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and but anyway. Um, there's no, you, you, you know, um, there's nothing to say that Jerry and Lone are not, do not, are not what, if they, if you trace them back, are not black, you know, one was in an orphanage, you just don't know. Uh, and uh, there's nothing, you know, so, and I think, so I think the idea of, of anybody who decides to write about black characters, um, despite, and if they write about them well, then I think that's probably something to say. The first black character I ever believed that written by a white writer that I knew um, was a character in a novel called, a very good novel called Camp Concentration mm -hmm. by, by Thomas M. Dish. Right. Um, and it was, uh, and it was, the character's name was Mordecai Washington. And Mordecai Washington was a soldier, a black soldier in an army brig that was being used, and the, all of the characters in the army brig, most of whom were white, but they were all being used for experimentation by the government. And the experiment killed you, essentially mm. over time. Uh, and uh, and it, was, it was a pretty chilling story in many, many ways. Uh, and the soldiers, uh, the brig soldiers take over, you know, one of the things that the experiments do, do is increase your intelligence, but also after six, eight, 10, 12, maybe a year and a half months, you die. Uh, and so the question is, could their, could their increasing intelligence Get them to the point where they could go, where where they could where, where they could win, where they could win, and they do. Uh, and uh, I would say I would uh, <clears throat> I would I think it's one of the best novels uh, of the uh, middle '60s, and it was published initially not in this country. It was published in New Worlds as a two-part serialization. That's where I first read it. I had met Dish briefly for a while. He came back to the United States and we were friends. Um, he was a very strange um, young, young man. And I think towards the end of his life, there were real problems. He killed himself on July 4th, um, which I don't think was an accident uh, in New York. I cannot remember the actual the, the specific year. But it's a book I, I would advise you all to read. Uh, and he wrote some other very, very good books together. Also exper one experimental book uh, uh, called 334 uh, and a, a bunch of short stories, one, uh, one, uh, one bunch of which I edited. Um, uh, and so I think these are, you know, these are all writers that I think you could, that are, that are worthwhile reading, as I do another friend of mine, uh, Joanna Russ, uh, who's another author that I push uh, all the time. Uh, I push her as well in my class at, at, at State, it's a science, tech, and society class. So we're yeah. going to get mm -hmm. Donna yeah. Harrow. Yes, yeah, there you go. Let me advance this right quick. Because I think, um, well, let me do it this way to ask you this final question. Uh, in your letters from Amherst. Oh, okay. All right. Nice to see. Uh, fairly recent, right? Yes. Yeah, uh, within the last year. 
Nayla Hopkinson uh, writes in the foreword, um, whenever timidity made me reluctant to put fingers to keyboard, especially when I was writing explicitly about queerness, sex, and sexuality, not to mention alternative relationship, structures and their intersections with race and gender, I would half humorously ask myself, what would Chip Delaney do? Okay, so I, I, I do, I say that to set up this question because um, the, the fact remains that, you know, you have written about race and racism. From time, yes, from time, from time to time, yes. Um, and, and it's come through your fiction, your memoirs, your essays. This is the question. Do you see important societal shifts that just maybe your presence on the planet in these times have contributed to? Writing about what your own fiction accomplishes is probably, or what it has accomplished, is probably the one thing that the writer is least prepared to answer. You're just in the wrong position. Um, I, you can tell me a lot more about what my fiction has meant to you than I can. Mm -hmm. You know, you read it. I just wrote it. Um, I can tell you whether I worked hard at it or, you know, or whether, you know, when I write anything, I write, work as hard as I possibly can. <clears throat> I suffer from something called dyslexia, um, which um, Octavia Butler also suffered from, uh, and we were both, um, we had very, very different responses to it. Um, I became comfortable doing readings from my work. Uh, she never did, and at a certain point, she, uh, um, I was, uh, I, she stopped giving reading, she stopped reading during showing, she would only talk. Uh, I think she was a better talker than I was. One of the reasons that I, I don't usually do interviews, or at least for many years I didn't do them. Uh, in fact, I, I recently, I, um, the, um, I just, the last little, little book I wrote uh, is, uh, was, was a, up until the day before yesterday was called Why I Write, mm -hmm. uh, because that was the topic that was given me by the people who asked me to write it. And the first, um, it was a, it's a section, a series of notes, and the first note is a quote from Theodore Sturgeon, which says, um, I write because of all the things I cannot do in the living room. <laughs> You know, it's mm -hmm. a, like, uh, I don't think I'm, I think I'm okay in the living room. I think I'm okay in a situation like this, but I don't think I'm at my best. I think I'm much better when I'm, or I was much better at one time when I'm got a pencil and paper and I can put it down, I can look at it and then I can go back and I can revise it. You know, when you talk like this, you can't revise. You're stuck with what comes out of your mouth. Uh, and sometimes that works, and sometimes you think, no, that's not exactly what I wanted to do. Whereas you can go back and, and make those changes when you actually write. So uh, I bring that up specifically to, to, to then pivot to Eugene Redmond. So uh, let me just say okay. this. Okay, all right. You want to take his unmute, all, you want to unmute Eugene, but I want to say this to, to you, Chip. Um, yeah, I uh, put in my request and ordered, and it arrived uh, about several weeks ago in a box, but the box was heavy, so I didn't think it was for me. And I didn't <laughs> think it was the book I ordered, so I just, you know, went in. and then I said, well, where is this? And this box is sitting, where is it? And I look, and it had my name on it, so I opened the box, I picked up the box, and wow, this is heavy. And then when I pick it up, I pick it up, and it's... Okay, the more recently released Through the Valley of the Nest of Spiders. Right, that's my last science fiction novel. That's right. Yeah. And so the question I have for you is because of where you take us, because, uh, you know, you, you like with Atlantis, you know, it's fiction, not science fiction. Again, you're taking us into the past in that. There are some area arenas where you deal with the present or the very recent past. But mm -hmm. you yes. take us into 
the uh, forthcoming future. And so I guess uh, my, my question to you regarding uh, this particular volume is, um, why the Southeastern coast? I have to ask that because I'm here in the South. Why okay. the Southeastern coast and why this unfolding near future? Because you know, that story is immersed in this century and it carries us off decade by decade. Yeah, okay. Not well, I wouldn't say that some of it's decade by decade, some of it's day by day, some of it's hour and hour, some of it's year by year. This is true. Um, uh, okay. Um, one of the things, okay, did I know Georgia at all? I once hitchhiked through it before, years before I wrote, and I had a, a, a sense of, and I visited Atlanta um, at Atlanta once, and I, as I said, and I once hitchhiked through Biloxi and all of those along the Georgia, along the coast, um, down through, down to Aransas Pass, Texas, Texas, and then, and I only did that once, uh, and it was quite an experience, uh, and then I flew back, and when I flew back, I got a, I suddenly thought, what, you would taken me four days to do, just by thumb, then took me th like three and a half hours, or four hours, to do by plane, which was a really strange, you know, I realized both how big and how small the United States was. Later on, when I went first went to Europe, I took a I I traveled by car and by thumb and by you know other play a train as well from um, uh, from Luxembourg to Istanbul. Mm -hmm. I realized that uh, it took me also took me about four days, and I realized so. What I, the Europe, this was this place that I've been thinking was a combination of how many different state, you know, how many different countries. These countries are as small, uh, they're just some uh, as small, some of them even smaller than um, than American states, you know, uh, and others of them are, you know, others of them are larger, you know, once you get to, uh, to Asia, then some of the states get, but the notion, you know, um, but I had a sense of it again because I I had I flew up then you know then I did some flying back and some hitchhiking back as well, um, and but I I learned that you know um, what when Europe talks about frequently they although they although they are unif although they are different because they have different languages and different currencies and different cultures, you know very very different cultures, yet they also have um, uh, yet, yet they also have, um, they, they also are as small in many cases as, as, as states. I, one of the things I used to be, I, I was used to be fond of saying is that Queen, Queen Elizabeth the uh, first ruled over not quite as many people as the governor of New Jersey, you know. Uh, and we, you know, uh, and which you know, and that's that's a good thing to keep in mind, you know. And and England produced, you know, England alone produced an immense amount of great literature. This place that was, you know, this place uh, that was smaller than New Jersey produced, um, you know, produced, you know, Shakespeare and George Bernard Shaw. Well, well, that's of course that's from Ireland. Uh, although that's part of the British, uh, you know, again, uh, <clears throat> and their, their cultures are so different. Uh, and, uh, and I, you know, and for a while I lived, well, for a while I actually lived in England for two years, which was a, a great adventure on its own. And suddenly uh, people who, um, uh, in America, my name is constantly misspelled, even today. Uh, D-E-L-A-N-Y is the way you spell it, but people are always putting an E before the Y. You know, um, in I never went anywhere in England where somebody, when I said your name is Delaney, they say is that is that Y is that N Y or is that E Y? You know, uh, and because N Y E Y was uh, uh, <clears throat> N Y was Scottish and E Y was Irish, and they wanted to know are you Scottish or Irish? To which I said no, I'm African American, um, and <laughs> to which they often said what's that? Um, <laughs> But that's how that's how that that works. Okay. <laughs>
but the, uh, so you got the south, the southeastern, and the, this, this, this. I, I like the extrapolation that I'm experiencing here, and then the narrative is highly immersive, and I'm enjoying that. So I'll probably come back to you in a message okay, uh, sure. okay. once I finish it. But okay. what I want to do is I want to thank you for all of this exchange. Don't go anywhere. Let I'm me not. <laughs> I'm very too <laughs> interested in what everybody else has to say. Which Great. Is so let, me, let me go to go to Eugene. Um, and you are unmuted, sir. Eugene Redmond, how are you? Yeah. I'm fine. I'm fine. Uh, yeah, man, uh, we go way back because I first got introduced to you at the University of Maryland because our good friend Otis Williams would have yeah. campus back there in the 70s and 80s and 90s. As I look out and I see another person who used to be at the University of Maryland, Joycey Joyce. Hi, Joyce. But um, as a result, you know, let's, let's move this forward. You know, Henry Dumas is especially essential, I guess you could say, in this discourse around Afrofuturism. You know, we could start with his fiction, right? Fawn, Will the Circle Be Unbroken? Um, and I like to always go to his interview with Sun Ra, Art and the Ankh, right? But yeah. um, uh, all of those things are powerful. And I guess you being a close associate and well-versed in his work, um, what was it about Henry Dumas that led him through that interview, you would think, with Sun Ra? I want to go there first, to step out of the literary, to step into the music and the philosophy of Ra and that music, because they must have seen eye to eye and enjoyed one another's company, and that exchange is rich. Uh, what can you say about that that gives us even greater insight to either of them, but more importantly, Henry Dumas? Well, from what I gathered about uh, Henry Dumas' um, childhood and from what I witnessed during my personal relationship with him, um, which was slightly under a year, we met in 60, 1967 at uh in East St. Louis, my hometown, mm -hmm. where there was a school known as the Experiment in Higher Education. Experiment again. And um it was the product of those forces in the 1960s that produced all manner of programs and projects, special schools, uh, street corner academies, and so on. War on poverty. And so one of the things was, of course, uh, these, these new, of all, among them all, you know, were these new, um, these new schools, you know, street corner philosophers, uh, new music, of course. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The word black being put in front of almost everything that we did, you know, it seemed like it was overnight. Because before that, it was like Negro music, Negro food, and so on. And all of a sudden, everything, it's, it, may, it may appear to be very normal and common now, but all of a sudden, you, you were a black musician. You cooked black food. Your lady was a black beauty. Your man was a black, uh, handsome person or a black genius. Uh, so we we met in the center of all of that in East St. Louis, and uh, Dumas was always what some would call far out. Uh, put it differently, you might quote Miles Davis and say, far in. So 
we're inching toward this whole idea, speculation, uh, the always on the, on the cutting edge of creativity, adventuresomeness. That was him. I witnessed that. I witnessed that daily. Mm -hmm. um, he was a collector and always carried both a camera and a tape recorder. And once you started talking, if if, if, it's, if it was something he, he hadn't heard before, or didn't know, or even if he knew it, he wanted your take on. So he took pictures uh, and he recorded what was going on. So he became a, a protege of Sun Ra. Um, this space is the place idea had already had always fascinated him since childhood. You know, his friends, his relatives talked about it. There are two things: he was very interested in the story, stories. And he was very interested in just what made people tick, as, as we might say. Mm -hmm. And he was very interested in religions. Mm -hmm. When he went in, first entered college, his idea, he was going to study religions. He moved to sociology. Wasn't actually interested in, in the formal study of literature so much, because he, he read all the time. And it's something that I, I say to my students that the idea of you studying writing, that is the creative aspect of it, is, was, that was almost anathema to us. The idea of going in and taking a course in how you write poetry. And I, I always tell my students, I remember when, I could count the number of creative writing, the degree granting uh, schools on one or two hands. Um, so what you did was you took your courses, you went in to your, to your teachers, you know, for conferences, for office hour. And when you finished, reciting Chaucer. Then you handed the teacher a couple of poems. Or when you finished reciting Shakespeare, now the, the 60s were split. You had some people who were older, I was older, right? Leroy Jones slash Amir Baraka was older. Raymond Patterson was older. Sonia Sanchez was older. In other words, we were already adults. But then you had younger people like Haki Madhubuti and others. Some were as young as 18. I mean, some of the people who turned out. So, so we just started reading. I mean, we started, you read. You read, 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 and you, uh, writing for you the world of writing was not about taking a course in how you write, except for composition. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Duma had read so much on his own and he studied world religions and he was into the, uh, you know, he, he knew the, the occult, he knew about it. He really, whatever was unique, and different, he would fasten himself to that, to that voice. And uh, he loved that. So that's what I got from him. One of his best friends, one of his childhood friends said while we were riding from the church to uh, the cemetery, you know, after his funeral, he was driving the car I was sitting in. And he said, uh, you know, Henry, Henry was so deep 
and I quoted him several times, this guy. He said, um, he thought deep, much, much deeper than the average person. Mm -hmm. He was so far of all, ahead of all of us. Mm -hmm. So that, that was Henry Dumas. Yeah. So I can see how he sought out and uh, met regularly with Sun Ra. Mm -hmm. um, his, his great tribute to Sun Ra, the, the longest story that he wrote, uh, the metagenesis of Sun Ra. Right. And right there, you, you, you have, you know, is <laughs> the nexus, nexus of what, what, what is actual and today say, you might say virtual, you know, <laughs> but much, much, but he went a greater distance beyond that. Um, the way Duma ate, you know, when he was eating and talking, when he was listening to music, I really got a, got lessons in Sun Ra by going to his office. Not only did I get lessons in Sun Ra, but I began to play music, which to this day I've done. Students would come to my classes and his classes before class began. If there had been no, no class in his classroom, he would roll in the, uh, the box. <laughs> mm -hmm. he, would, he, would, he would roll in his record player mm -hmm. and he would play music for uh, up to half hour, 20 minutes, before mm -hmm. students would come and bring their friends. They would, they would actually have a, a date. <laughs> come to this professor's room and you hear music. Then when class began, the date or the friend uh, went on to his or her class. But I got that practice from him, and I did it for 45 years in the classroom. Man, I got that from Otis. <laughs> okay, I know. There you go. There you go. So at, uh, he worshipped his sons, and... He uh, wrote a little poem. He wrote a poem called "My Little Boy," and it says, uh, "My little boy speaks with an accent." I must remember one day to put my head down and ask him the name of the country he comes from. I like his accent. So the Africanism. Yes. <laughs> the Africanisms uh, were what he looked for all of the time. Copious notes, copious recordings. So he straddled that. I mean, that, uh, you know, growing up, we know that um, Black people are given names. Later you find out, you study, it's, it's, it's an African practice. You're given, you may have up to three names. I had like four nicknames. And it was widespread. Everybody had a name that certain people called them. Uh, and a name that a smaller group of certain people called them. A name your mama called you, your daddy called you. I know everybody listening knows what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. so what he did was to trace all of that as much as he could you know, teleologically into Du Bois's con continuum. Mm -hmm. And at the experiment in higher education, that was how we taught. And I have students that I taught 53 years ago, 1967, a poet named Sherman Fowler. He moved to Africa. Many of the students moved to Africa. People, of course, changed their names, as you know. Uh, Chris Jones became Ahmad Jamal, and you go on and on and on. But Dumas was very different in the way he renamed himself, and it was it was much more um, eclectic. His name was Henry Lee Dumas, mm -hmm. birth name. Mm -hmm. So he took, but his nickname was Hank. Mm -hmm. He rearranged the letters in the word Hank 
and came up with Ankh. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a, wow. <laughs> His last name, Duma, was, had his letters rearranged to Samu because he was, he was in the Arabian Peninsula mm -hmm. for a year in the Air Force, right? So he had, he had an interesting mix uh, of the colored world, you know? <laughs> so, so, um, Ankh Samu, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. he was That's always reaching, always reaching. So those are some of my, so it was it was natural that he would reach out to Sun Ra and that Sun Ra would reach to him. The night that Henry was killed, mm -hmm. he talked Sun Ra talked him into leaving a pistol mm -hmm. a thirty two, which I took him to buy because the night that uh Martin Luther King was killed, you know, I suggested to him that, you know, you need a weapon. That was very common in the movement. Mm -hmm. And so we went and um, uh, there's so many anecdotes really, uh, associated with this. But he went to see um, Sun Ra and uh, they, were, they were talking. Uh, Henry was a little bit anxious about what was happening. You know, Malcolm had been killed. Martin had been killed, and then many little Malcolms and little Mark Marcuses in our communities mm -hmm. were killed under suspicious circumstances. I can name them for mm -hmm. Fred Almond Evans in Cleveland, mm -hmm. um, Taylor Jones the Third in East St. Louis. I just go through the cities and name uh, the people. The famous ones, of course, got were known, right? So, mm -hmm. so the news of their deaths mm -hmm. spread across the country. But in every city, there were King-like shootings. There were Malcolm-like assassinations. Chicago and the Panthers there. Mm -hmm. So, we get it. We were anxious, and you know, I said to him, you know, well, let's go and uh, get you some, uh, get you some. Uh, uh, enforcement <laughs> and and then he crossed over into New York crossed over into Harlem and he was he was killed that same night you know um, so that's sort of a picture of him southern sweet home and 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 what do we find sweet home later we love it Tony Morrison that's right. I mean, his, his influences are so wide. And of course, Morrison helped me, you know, this marks the 52nd year that I, what Morrison called the cult of Henry Duma, has been editing his work mm -hmm. and uh, holding different kinds of happenings mm -hmm. to bring attention to his work so that it would get a bigger, wide audience. Um, but our generation was very, uh, very, very much influenced by Hank and, um, the, um, I have to give credit, you know, cause some of the, some of the greatest names in our literature, James Baldwin, who admired and supported him, gave him an award for a story. Um, uh, in a contest sp sponsored by uh, the Black Scholar magazine, mm -hmm. James Baldwin and Joyce Ladner, the sociologist mm -hmm. who had worked with Duma at the experiment in higher education, mm -hmm. awarded him first prize in, in a fiction contest, mm -hmm. posthumously. Mm -hmm. He just got uh, a Penn Oakland before Columbus American Book Award posthumously, just days ago. Yeah, from Ishmael, um, Reed. Yeah, Ishmael Reed, right. So that that was Henry Dumas. I think this can idea I, of Ben hmm? Can I pivot? Because sure. you raised the significance of this interconnectedness between what we've experienced over the past more recent years with Black Lives Matter 
and yeah. uh, Henry uh, Dumas' experience and him being taken away from us in a self-same manner mm-hmm. over 50 years ago. In the self-same regard, you also talked about how this sort of, oh, you got to protect yourself. Yes. And you also talked, we, we initiated this discussion, we're talking about why the significant connection between Sun Ra and Henry uh, Dumas. Yeah. And so the question I want to go to before I jump to Ayana is, um, how, do you, how could you say um, maybe, and this might be true of yourself as well, how you both might embrace the importance of black music as a survival mechanism, as a weapon. And let, let, let me just say say this before, <clears throat> and it probably answers. Now, one of the people that some of us studied with was Fela Sawande. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nigerian who had it got a had it, had it. Dr. Fela. Mm-hmm. Mute ethnomusicologist, philosopher, right. writer. Mm-hmm. He said to us one day, if you had to find one word that would be synonymous with black people, mm-hmm. and everyone must read his a pamphlet called From the Center to the C- Circumference and from the circumference to the center, Mm -hmm. about 50 pages. Mm -hmm. He said, no one should ever attempt to define or explain a people in one word. But something like, if somebody had a gun to your head and said, give me one word for black people. And he said, it would be music. Now, a few years later, we were talking. No, I'm sorry. He didn't say music. Oh, let's say. He said it would be belief. Excuse me. Let me take that back. He said it would be belief. And then a few years later, I was around him, and I said, you know, Professor, if someone put a gun in your head and asked you, what's the second word you would use for um, the uh, to uh, to define a black person, I said, I, I would say music. Mm-hmm. And he said, very good, very good. You know, he's talking. <clears throat> so belief and he, and later music. So <clears throat> of course, he, he called James Brown, John Coltrane, and many other of our musicians, cultural stabilizers. He was the first person, Duma, was the first person I heard uh, use that term, mm-hmm. cultural state. And on some of his pa- on some of the papers he returned to students, he said, "Read Margaret Walker!" Exclamation marks. <laughs> cultural stabilizers. Mm-hmm. So. And you're talking now, you're talking now, thir- early 30s, mm-hmm. this young man, Duma, he's in his early 30s. We were three years apart in age. But um, so it uh, indisputable and, indif- and indispensable mm-hmm. music. Mm-hmm. He haunted it. He haunted the blues clubs, gospel music. Jay Wright, who was his friend, who was a great poet, said that possibly, possibly Langston Hughes knew more about the gospel and the spiritual than Hank. Possibly. Now you're talking about somebody who could have been Hank's father, right? <laughs> but Jay says he haunted the, the concerts and the clubs. And only Langston Hughes might have known more about gospel and and the spirituals than Henry Duma. Mm -hmm. So, you know, music was, and I knew that. I mean, he 
he read at the clubs in that 10 months I took him to every club and every soul food you know place and he would just stand up and, uh, right there you know while we're eating and recite something because he, he felt the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, music was. It was under his tutelage that I really uh, came to understand and love Sun Ra. Mm -hmm. When I first heard Sun Ra, mm -hmm. you know, bats screaming and all. You know, you're like, what is this? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a doo wop man, a Duke Ellington, <laughs> what that that that. <laughs> but yes, uh, okay. music and. And uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> so let me, let me stay with us. Let me shift over to mm -hmm. Ayana, who, uh, Chris, you're going to unmute her so I can keep, keep this moving. Um, because we're going into this discussion and you might want to uh, click unmute Ayana. He may have un un unleashed you. So you might want to click or if it doesn't, then we'll ask Chris to do it or uh, Kim. Oh, there we go. Ayana. Hi. Hey. Yes. So we now, as I speak to you, understand, and all of you out there, I'm on the East Coast. She's on the West Coast. So this is a national discussion that's taking place within the context of advancing our understanding of Afrofuturism and the whole notion of where we find ourselves at this moment in time moving forward in the 21st century. And so Ayana, first let me start with this because I think it's important uh, for the discussion's advancement that you share with us, tell us about your research into Octavia Butler. Sure, so I have to say first, it's not only that this is the national conversation, but also this is like hyper local and that I live close to and grew up in the place where Octavia not only grew up and was reared, but also where she writes about. And mm -hmm. also the place that the parable of the sowers, the parable of the sower and the parable of the talents takes place and also parts of Kindred um, and, and other parts of her books um, where we can see the San Gabriel Mountains, which were just on fire last you know there's still a fire that they're putting out that probably got put out um overnight over the rain one of the largest um los angeles national forest fire so the place is very specific um and i think you know my heart is beating fast because i feel like i'm part of history right like the camera is zooming in on my consciousness and I, my mind is blown but I, my work has to do with Octavia's local connection and experiences to place and how those places um, and her her experiences as a, a children a child of the Great Migration her folks came from Louisiana in 1930 um, to Los Angeles um, and how she ended up being such a huge um, influence on many 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 different avenues and she was as Chip Delaney She grew up and um, I founded this organization called the Octavia E. Butler Legacy Network based on that research. Now, I did this research before the article mm -hmm. um, and then I went to the archives to fact check and make sure that anything I'd theorized or pieced together from available interviews was accurate. Um, and I've done many, many different um, uh gatherings large and small at places like princeton where i first met um, Ronaldo anderson and um john jennings um and uh really sort of highlighting the work that's being done that's inspired by her work and also the lineage of folks and the traditions that she comes out of as a theorist and as uh, a literary and cultural figure um but as a real person so that's kind of my uh where i'm where I'm at and where I come from. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the archives, 
all of, you know, just like I was just sharing, you know, we now have access uh, to, to Chip's letters. Um, I can also look over here and I have that wonderful collation of your journals, uh, Chip, just to let you know that, uh, which was published, but I'm waiting for it. There's got to be another volume because that stopped off at some point. So when we talk about Octavia and what she wrote and, you know, by, you know, the discussions that I had with her, I always marveled at because I also, you know, I'm a scientist and a microbiologist as well. And when we had a discussion back in the 90s, you know, what I marveled at was the discussion we were able to have about Lynn Margulis, who used to be married to uh, Carl Sagan, and how much... Uh, Octavia knew about her endosymbiosis theory. And uh, yeah, right. that really struck up a wonderful relationship for us. But embedded in that archive are all of these wonderful kernels, all of such amazing access to her thinking and, and her understanding of the world. And I think um, so many scholars and others have been informed by this or influenced by it. What what have you seen thus far? Because you've set up a whole network. And so you've been able to engage quite a few people. So what have you seen that, that gives us this greater insight into how people are uh, diving into this archive? So um, I have to say, I knew where her papers were going before she even passed away because she had reported this to someone that I knew. Mm -hmm. So um, I personally never met her, although uh, my uh, I would see her around um, during the times when she would come back and visit. And there was a bus stop like near a hair salon that my stepmom opened. So it was a very weird universe. But in any case, before she passed away, someone told me that her papers were going there. Um, and so before they even sent the press release to the public in 2009 saying that we had gotten the papers, they were willed here to the Huntington Library, which is a whole separate story as Robin is bringing up. Um, the archive is vast and growing, right? Initially, there are about 8,000 individually cataloged items and over 350 boxes. And now there's like over 10,000 individually um, cataloged items and just, you know, dozens of drafts and letters and grocery lists and journals and, you know, just not like nonsense that she kept. She, she kept everything and she had her own filing system. Um, and so it's like re remarkable that um, someone has gone in there, it took over three and a half years to organize the initial 8,000 items and then some subsequent boxes were given by her estate and then they took some time to go through them and catalog them. So the only reason why I was able to access them is because I was a PhD student, I was finishing my dissertation. Um, and uh, you have to know San Marino, the actual city where the archives are held in this place that, um, it's a strange place in that it has more income per capita than Beverly Hills. Um, and it was a sundown town where the only black folk and her mother cleaned for some folks up the street from where her papers are kept, right? So the fact that she wrote that place into her will and her archives are the most often accessed and had the longest list of scholars inquiring about when the archives were gonna open before it was available, right? So she has skyrocketed past all of these like illuminated uh, medieval manuscripts, more than Jack London's books and papers. This little black girl uh, with dyslexia, um, whose mother was a maid for some folks up the street, right? Who, who cleaned for Paul Fussell's family up the street from the Huntington. It's like, the, the, it's phenomenal that she accomplished so much um, and that we can, I'm sort of like a, a mediator in a way because I'm local. I can drive there in 10, 15 minutes and go there and um, fall, go through whatever protocols in order to access and read those materials. But I think regular folks um, like her mother who had three years of education should also have some access to the information. So I'm very much into being more like Duma, right? And being in places and relationship and in fellowship with people and in community, talking about how she was a real person, you know, mm. seeing how mm. much money she didn't have and how many meals she would have to skip or how Warner hadn't paid her her advance for Kindred and her rent was due, right? So these are very real things. In addition to all of her brilliance her and her intelligence and all of the things that we see, you know, on the surface that 
you know, is on PBS and CNN and all these places, right? I feel like right. she was one of the, the leading luminaries that has sparked all of these black folk and queer folk getting um, genius grants now, even this year. Um, mm -hmm. So her lineage is like wider than what we call science fiction, speculative fiction, and certainly whatever is categorized Afrofuturism. I use her work to teach ethnic studies. So. Mm -hmm. Um, there have been musical interpretations of her work to stay on that, that cipher we have going, it seems. <laughs> we brought music into the discussion. Yes. We had the likes of Nicole Mu uh, Mitchell, a uh, flautist and composer who's, you know what, I've got several volumes here. A more recent one is actually entitled Earthseed. Um, as far as yeah. I know, though, she's done that based on the published books and not the archives, right? Right. It's right. like that. But, so, but to, to put it, to pivot, it is though that her work has gained this level of popularity and influence uh, to, to not limit us to the archive, but to also say that her work has had this influence and we've got the interpretations that are forthcoming relative to television, uh, relative to the literary translation of the work for the screen. And so I, I just wanted to, get your thoughts on um, these ways in which her work is being advanced. Um, there is the archive, but there is this whole larger immersion. Uh, Toshi and Bernice Johnson Reagan, you know, they interpreted and created a whole opera uh, built around the parables. Right. Uh, which premiered in Dubai and then premiered in the States right here in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and my good friend Tony Small's daughter, uh, Shaina, was yes. the lead. <laughs> so they're good friends. But I just want to ask you, um, the significance of this, these approaches says something. What does it say to you? Well, I have to just say the whole framework of this pandemic has really been bookended for me as an Octavia Butler scholar because uh, when Toshi brought the opera to UCLA, mm -hmm. to LA for its premiere, mm -hmm. I believe it was like March 7th, right? Mm -hmm. So like March 3rd or 4th, there was a state of emergency declared in Los Angeles County and by the governor. So mm -hmm. when we were gathering and coming together and going to events ahead of that, um, um, it, it's her work is not just like a one-off thing where you go and you show up in your nice clothes and you like mm -hmm. pretend like mm -hmm. Toshi really does grassroots work just like the work in activism that brought us the resolution of this mm -hmm. election mm -hmm. so we had coronavirus starting up right um and then we had state of emergency then that was the last live performance before everything was shut down so wow. there was a 1200 seat sold out performance um, but people were still there knowing that something was coming and being gathered together. And since the coronavirus and the shutdown and that performance of the opera, which is really a exhibition of, you know, over 200 years of black music mm -hmm. and now and beyond, right? Her Parable of the Sower has reached the bestseller list, um, which is something that she dreamed of only about what, four or five weeks ago. So to me, it means that like, you know, my heart is beating fast because people are like, oh, oh, Ayana, you're not just obsessed, right? This is actually something that's happening. People think that Octavia was telling the future when she was like, oh, no, no, no. I'm just a student of the world and I'm observing what's happening now. And this is where we're going if we do not uh, put the brakes on, for example, uh, climate, climate, like climate change is a is a character in those books. So for me, her work has been prescient in that she understands human beings. Someone spoke earlier about the connection between psychology, religion, spirituality, music, and how those things are overlapping. Um, and Octavia definitely was clued into that. And you see that in the archive. You see that in her published work, but you see it in the archive where she's literally going to the LA Public Library, checking out the books, about world religions or whatever, or the etymology of words. So, you know, you've had conversations with her, but she certainly is just, you know, an organic intellectual um, and um, a community accountable scholar in the best kind of way, which is what um, Alexis Pauline Gum says. And Alexis- That is, 
Good. Go there. Well, you were that's where well, Alexis I'm was the external reader on my dis. I'm sorry. Let me just say this. Let me just say this to put her in context, because here in North Carolina, we have a community called Earthseed um, that Toshi uh, and her mother engaged when they performed uh, the piece here. But we also have here uh, Afrofuturist, feminist, uh, matriarchal scholar Alexis Pauline Gums who actually every Sunday does a, um, an actual uh, service. church service at the uh, North Star Church of the Arts, which was established by the Freelon family, um, uh, which includes uh, Nina Freelon, jazz vocalist, and uh, her husband, Phil Freelon, who was one of the designers of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, and their children and others uh, in the community. So yeah, she has that service every Sunday, because I was hoping I wanted to have her on a panel, but she's taken every Sunday, which is okay. But I say all of that to say that, yes, she has written quite a bit, and she's here in North Carolina, but she's every place else, and she also is very much connected to you. And so tell us about that relationship. So I, um, she's like my elder in Octavia, although I think in Earth Year, she's younger than me. So she was my um, external reader on my dissertation. Um, and so she was a person reading from the Black feminist archival, uh, you know, reading from this tradition that I'm sort of dipping into um, and she was a person who was reading my work, another scholar who wanted to get into the archives because she had read letters between um, Audre Lorde and Octavia Butler and Audre Lorde and Tony K. Bambara. Um, and she was an expert in the field that I was sort of articulating like Octavia Butler studies because you like you need its own, you need it needs its own genre to talk about all the multifaceted inter multidisciplinary work that she was doing as you know so mm -hmm. she she read she's her signatures on my dissertation so she's read the whole draft of my work on butler's life um and so that's that's a great thing and also alexis was at um, many of the performances of the opera including in la i saw her in la here um when we had that performance i, I don't know if she was there just for that but she was in the area so there's a lot of um, overlapping community connections. Um, and even though I'm here on the West Coast, I'm very much love and admire lots of work going on all over the place. Like the Free Black Women's Library in New York, which y'all were talking about in New York earlier, um, mm -hmm. founded by Oluranki Okinmowo as well. So mm -hmm. lots of great things happening mm -hmm. around her work. Cool. Let me now pivot um, to keep us moving, because we still have actually four people, and I'm going to move through these questions rather quickly with folks. And uh, Glenn, where are you at? Uh, we need Glenn unmuted. Can you? There we go. Glenn, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How you doing, Darren? Um, uh, great. As you were sharing even earlier, you, you, you know, your birth date is on the same date as Chip Delaney's April 1st. Yeah. You attended the Bronx High School of Science. Okay. You were a student of Octavia Butler. Um, tell us about your interaction with her. All right. So um, I first met her back in uh, 96. Um, I was just beginning to write. I was very excited about meeting her. Um, I'd read some of her books. I'd read two of her books at that point. And um, I was just really excited to meet one of the handful of black science fiction writers there were at the time. And I was lucky enough to be in a place and a time when I actually could get two. Uh, I got her and I got Chip Delaney. And Steve Barnes was at a competing or, or concurrent um, uh, event at Dragon Con uh, at, the, at that same time. Uh, Dragon Con used to be in, in June, now it's on Labor Day weekend. Um, but I, I got to meet the three living, recognized science fiction authors, and I just felt very, very small. Um, Octavia Butler, um, after I, I told her I was writing and she saw some of the things I was writing, she, she you know, invited me up on the stage and it just wasn't my time. And I just said, no, this is, 
you know, for you and, and, and Samuel Delaney, you know, you guys are giants, I'm an ant. <laughs> and it, I just felt it wasn't my time. But over the years, what I recognized, and after, after talking to her after that um, by phone, is she, she wanted to show continuity. You know, um, so, uh, you know, I Chip Delaney's work I had been introduced to by a good friend of mine from uh, high school. And I didn't even know when I first met him, I didn't know that, that he went, you know, we went to the same high school. Um, I didn't know that I was born the year that he graduated from that high school. Uh, I didn't know, um, you know, much, I hadn't read his work yet. I just, you know, I just learned about him. I've read some of his things since then, but um, just, you know, the, the, expansion of um, uh, Afrofuturism, African-American science fiction, black science fiction, speculative science fiction, whatever you want to call it, um, was, was just in its infancy at that time. And it only had just a few representatives. And, you know, I, I recognized the need um, to, you know, expand this. So, you know, I began writing, but at the same time, I was just starting the, um, my practice and I was getting busier and busier, and, and I just kind of uh, got swept up into that. But um, it, it, was, it was something that I'd always um, you know, cherished, that connection with Octavia Butler. The conversation we had was just too short, and it was incomplete. I wish that I had maintained that relationship with her. Um, but she, she really uh, warmed up as a person, and you know, began sharing some really you know, kind of personal things. Well, you, um, you know, brother, for me, I love my hard science fiction, right? I like science fiction with the science, um, whether it's speculating on it or bringing it into play. That's who I am. That's how I was sired. Yeah, science is another aspect of my identity. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what I want to know about, about your book, um, Dragon's Air. Um, so Dragon's Air. science into it. And what is, what is that science that you bring into your story? Well, because of my background, um, I always like to bring in uh, hard science. And um, I like to incorporate it into the story. You know, one of the things that, that Octavia Butler, Butler left me with is, she said, never let facts get in the way of telling a good story. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I wanted to incorporate uh, a lot of facts in my stories. So I think I was fairly careful about incorporating um, astrophysics, um, uh, Einsteinian physics and relativity, um, of course, biology, which is my background, uh, and immunology, which is, you know, my, uh, my suit as a rheumatologist. So, you know, putting all those things in um, a taxonomy of, of species in terms of how I set up uh, some of the, the uh, organization of this, this civilization, this culture. Um, I, I, I wanted to put all those things in, but I didn't want those to overwhelm the story. Mm -hmm. So at the heart of the mm -hmm. story is this archeologist, beautiful archeologist who comes to, to um, uh, Earth on, an, on a scientific expedition, um, along with the commander of the, um, of the mission. And the, the story is, is really wound around their relationship. Um, and it's not a traditional uh, romantic relationship. There's some of that in it, uh, but they are different species who are physically incompatible. Um, but uh, their relationship is extremely uh, tight and extremely deep. Um, and I, I hope that the reader gets that through the story. But, um, you know, like Octavia Butler did, and you know, I, I hadn't really digested all of that at the time, um, I, I wanted to make sure that I was um, fulfilling an, um, an allegorical relationship to educate. I always want to do that. You know, I, I used to teach at, at Morehouse and at Emory, and I, I just enjoy teaching. And one of the ways that I teach is by um, having an example or a comparator um, to uh, explain something that may be more complicated. So um, I wanted to build a culture that was completely naive to all the petty stuff that goes on between human beings, you know, whether it's um, uh, um, battling over uh, race or gender or education or haves and have nots. I, I wanted to put all that aside for them. Uh, they don't have it, but they do have some parallels, but they literally put 
all mankind in one basket. Uh, and I thought it'd be interesting for any reader, any human reader, to read this and come and come at it from the same place. And I put everybody, give everybody the same perspective towards these people um, as they, you know, um, put all of us in a single monolithic uh, basket, which, you know, is, is not where any of us believe that we come from. You know, the African-American community is not monolithic. The Latino the next community is not monolithic. Uh, you know, the LGBTQ um, community is definitely not monolithic. So I, I wanted to, um, to put people who do think that way um, into the position where they're looking from the inside out the way so many of us are. Okay. So to keep us moving, you're in hot Atlanta. You, you yes, I am. <laughs> And so Hotlanta's got, well, Janelle Monet, Outcast. Um, do you see the South and maybe Atlanta specifically as a Afrofuturist hotspot? And if so, why? It is. It, you know, I, I call Atlanta uh, Hollywood East. Uh, we've got the Tyler Perry Studios. We have a number of other studios here. We have um, mega um, blockbusters that have been filmed here or partly filmed here. Uh, even Black Panther, the uh, British Museum was actually our high museum here in Atlanta. So, um, you know, Atlanta is really hot right now. Um, so many of our actors, um, if they're not from Atlanta, they have homes here, they spend a lot of time here. Uh, the music industry here is second to none. Okay. So, okay. Uh, and, and as, as uh, Professor Redmond said, you know, music informs a lot of, of what we are in our culture. Uh, and I would say, as a chubby man, uh, so too does cooking and, and uh, seasoning, you know. And, and I, 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 um, uh, I compare writing with cooking. You know, you can make a hamburger. You can take a, a patty and you can slap it in the pan and, and brown it on both sides and you got a hamburger. But you don't have my mother's hamburger. Okay, there are no onions, you don't have the peppers, you don't have the, all those other things I couldn't pronounce when I was a little kid, you know, mixed into that hamburger meat. Okay, mm -hmm. so, and then, and then if I go to my wife's side, she's from New Orleans, and I need to say no more. But, um, you know, writing, writing is a lot like that. Uh, writing requires putting in uh, nuance. Um, you know, you use all the five senses when writing. And Octavia Butler was very, very good at that. Um, and so many other writers are too. You know, I've, I've um, only recently gotten into some of uh, Chip's writings and mm -hmm. he explores things on the astro plane, on the internet, before there are any such things around. This is why he's the godfather of science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, you know, the, uh, the point that I'm making is for what Octavia Butler saw in me many, many years ago was a young writer who needed polish, who needed coaching, who needed guidance. Um, and I think that now that there are more uh, science fiction writers around, while there are still old guys like me and, and um, you know, again, uh, uh, legends like Chip Delaney, you know, a lot of those things need to be explored. Um, and I, I would love to see you know, more of, of these, um, uh, the panelists who are so knowledgeable about speculative fiction, things that were not classified as science fiction, uh, but are now, uh, you know, clearly science fiction fantasy from an African-American uh, perspective. And that, that needs to be encouraged. And if I may, you know, I don't want to run on too long, but if I may, I would also- I gotta bring hope. Hope. Go ahead. I got to bring Hope in because she's got a she's got okay. a jet. Okay. <laughs> so make, make it quick, make it quick, right. make Afro it quick, or we can yeah. come Afrofuturism. Back to Afrofuturism is a great term. It's a great concept. Don't let that define us, though. Um, I, I think that science fiction is um, is huge, and I think that the the key to Afrofuturism is seeing science fiction, whether African Americans, Africans, people of color in it or not, is conceived through um, uh, a lens of somebody who comes to us with the baggage that um, people who've, who've uh, lived in any component of the uh, diaspora have lived. That lens changes what you see and how you tell a story. 
that it's important that you bring that up. I have to, I, I have to make it clear that as an Afrofuturist that I, I'm not just singularly immersed in it relative to literature. So, but I do have to also add because of we're pivoting to Hope Wabuki that there is this whole notion of Afrofuturism and African futurism as a singular word, as a singular term. In fact, just recently, there is a new anthology uh, that has come out, which also contains in it Nettie Okrafor's essay. And so I wanted to pivot to you, Hope, um, relative to this discussion. Um, how, is it, how important is it to have this distinction in the term? Um, and if you're familiar with it, that anthology itself. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. And thank you for um, having me as part of this panel. It's just been really wonderful to hear all the you know, amazing things everybody has been speaking to and I've been sitting here taking notes, my notebook a little bit. Um, and so, you know, to answer your question, it's, it's, it's such a complex question because there's two sides to it. You know, I, having lived in various regions of the diaspora, I come to it from, you know, my parents are from the continent, but I grew up in the States, but there's been you know, aware of the, the African diaspora throughout the world, whether it be Europe, Asia, um, the Central and South America. One of the things that I, I teach when I'm teaching African Lit, um, that I tell my students that they're very surprised by is that of the uh, 12 million Africans who were, you know, kidnapped from Africa and brought um, to uh, various to to what is now known as North and Central America, only you know 288,000 were brought to what is now known as the United States. The rest of those Africans who were kidnapped into slavery were were sent to Central and South America. You know, over um, 11 million. And so you know, but that's such a that's not really part of the conversation as we think about blackness and global blackness. And that does have to do with colorism that is endemic in Central and South America, as we know from Gloria Anzaldúa's Borderlands, as we know from Brazil, for example, with the severe colorism there to the extent of actually importing um, Nazi and other war criminals to whiten their, their country. And we see that, um, we see that uh, in, in continually throughout the world. And so I've always pushed back against that separation and um, looked at literature and looked at these conversations under the, under the umbrella of the global African diaspora. Mm -hmm. What is the commonality of global blackness? And mm -hmm. so I want to you know, make that clear and start from that space as I start from a space of inclusion. Um, where I think that the conversation between African futurism, Afrofuturism, and this larger conversation of Black speculative uh, literature is interesting is that it, how we think through these questions. And this is not a term I invented. Um, this is a term that Nydia Korfor, Dr. Nydia Korfor, a brilliant um, mind that she is, uh, invented and was thinking through with her own work. And as she is focused on her um, very prolific creativity, um, she did not feel like she had the space to, to really revel in the kind of um, demarcation of the, the analytical thought. And so she wrote you know, a, a quick uh, essay on her blog, and that's what's been you know, pretty much the kind of conversation of scholarship that there has been. And I remember when I interviewed her um, you know, maybe six years ago now, she was she was, you know, beginning to form these ideas, but now it's, it's, it's there. And so as I teach, and I'm, I'm, I was pointing my grad students to this conversation, and they were asking, where, where is the scholarship? And all I could really show them was Nnedi Okorafor's blog post. So that necessitated the, the article that I wrote in the Los Angeles Review of Books, just to have a kind of functional um, demarcation of what this conversation is. And so primarily the distinction that Nadia Korfor gets to is that she defines African futurism as a subcategory of science fiction that is similar to Afrofuturism, but that is more deeply rooted in African culture, history, mythology, and point of view. And it then branches into the black diaspora and does not privilege or center the West. Um, Okorafor also talks about African Jujuism, which is a subcategory of fantasy that respectfully acknowledges the seamless blend of true existing African spiritualities and cosmologies within the imaginative. And so I think the main 
the, the most useful um, thing that I get ahead on when I'm having this conversation and I'm with my students is that for a core of four, um, African futurism does not center or retain space for the white or Western gaze. Um, African futurism is centered and starts in our African gaze. And what I mean by that, for example, if we go back to even Mark Derry's um, introduction and definition of Afrofuturism, he defines it as literature that comes from the African American experience. So within that definition is African American, is American, is the West, and that's where it starts, and that's where it's centered. And it really is, is hooked into that Western lineage. And the core force work is thinking, how can we, you know, not center America? Right? That's where she begins. Mm -hmm. How can we begin that language and center Africa and African thought, African mythology, African spirit experience, African culture, and move out from there and branch out into the, the global African diaspora, where Western consciousness obviously is a part of that global African diaspora experience, but it is not the beginning and it is not the end and it's not the center. She's trying to move the center to Africa. And, and so, for example, um, you know, so for her, it's not enough to have black characters, perhaps, or um, because it's, for example, something like Independence Day, if we remember, you know, um, one of our wonderful movies starring Will Smith, um, you know, to have a black actor in a Western world or a Western construct is not enough. Um, for her, even something like Black Panther um, is still a mixture of Afrofuturism because of those scenes where we get, we come back to America and have a very kind of specific American billionaire philanthropic endeavor. We have this explanation to the kind of United Nations. We have the white gaze still. Um, and uh, a claim to be made that that has to do more with, um, you know, Hollywood and American politics of that way than, than anything that, that, that Cooper was getting at because the rest of the movie is, is really sunken in that kind of African futurist consciousness. So we have Lupita Nyong'o's character, you know, starting in the, the Boko Haram, trying to, you know, so you have um, really a lot of African history and African mythology brought into that space. And so, so the, uh, what Okorfer also mentions is that it, a text can have um, or rather my reading of her, her statement is that a text can have both of these things. A text can hold elements of African futurism and Afrofuturism, um, but an African futurist text is, is separate and different from an Afrofuturist text because of the African futurist text doesn't have space, um, doesn't center the Western days or culture. What I mean by that is, um, for example, take Lagoon um, by Nadia Koh for one of her wonderful novels where you have okay. about, um, Sorry? No, I was saying that that, that novel by, by Nettie is my favorite. Yes, yes. And it's because that you have the figure of the, the alien who comes to Earth and, um, you know, is not coming to destroy or enact violence. Like most um, alien movies that you see in the Western consciousness um, and the Independence Day, War of the Worlds, you know, Mars Attacks, all of those. The alien has come to spread enlightenment to show human beings how to take care of the planet and not harm the planet so they can be enlightened. Um, so that's the first thing and most fundamental is we have a sudden, we have a shift from this kind of Western patriarchal violent um, frame of colonization and domination um, that Nadia Korfor, as a, as a Niger-American, uh, as she terms herself, is very familiar with the history of colonization in Nigeria and in Africa as a whole and the damage of that. So rather than having that colonizing alien force, as you have in the primary majority of Western films and Western literature about the alien, you have the alien who is not a threat, the alien who does not come to colonize, but the alien who comes to share and enlighten. That's also tied in with the figure of Blackness that we see throughout the world where blackness, to be black is to be other, to be seen as the alien. Um, and so Nadia Korfor redefines the alien by centering the African gaze, by centering blackness. So the alien is not other, the alien is, is normalized. And thirdly, we have a kind of, um, uh, uh, um, a kind of destabilization of sexuality and, and, um, and, and fossilized norms. You have a kind of that like Audre Lorde taking apart the master's house to look for something else. And that's kind of the last um, aspect of African futurism that's so unique to it, where it has a, a real sense of that kind of black feminist um, worldview where you're 
where you're trying to dismantle all systems of aggression um, because they're all linked and look for something new. And so you see that in the figure of the alien and lagoon. And you see that not just in that particular work by Okorafor, but you see that through all of her work. Um, and the very last thing I want to say, Eli, is that, um, again, uh, the location is different. In, in, in Afrofuturist works, you still have the West, you know, you still have America being a very large part of it, or, or Europe in some degree. Um, in the Nadia Korfor's works, in Lagoon, in Who Fears Death, in, in an African futurist text that is a real African futurist text, she, she doesn't leave like, Nigeria, the aliens land in Lagos, you know, that, that's, where the, that's where the action stays, and you don't have to kind of twist yourself in knots to kind of make a space for whiteness. It's okay to not have whiteness in, in the gaze. And that is the fundamental difference that Okorafor sets up um, between African futurism and Afrofuturism. This relates to her concept of African Jujuism because it's dealing with African spirituality and imagining it in a kind of imaginative space in the future. And oftentimes, African spirituality has been very disrespected in Western consciousness. You have, you know, whether it's animal sacrifices or eating brains or, or just really disrespectful depictions of African spirituality. And what's, what's very problematic about that is that, that because African spiritualities are still alive and practiced today. And so as we're trying to create a kind of imaginative, fantastical world that's drawing from these spiritualities, Okorafor suggests that we need to create space and prioritize the idea that these are real living religions and real living people that are practicing these beliefs. So how can we engage with, with them, um, these ideas ethically and um, with respect? Yeah. Thank you, Hope. I think you've, you've laid it out. In fact, you've reached back and connected to the previous uh, panel discussion that we had, because that's where, that's where we all intersected, was with this whole notion of African spirituality in so many ways. Uh, the derivative forms that manifest themselves here in the Western Hemisphere, Santeria, Condomble, um, uh, Voodoo, uh, but also in the self-same regard, it was also stated that there is an embrace and a practice that is there and that it works and that more and more of us, especially in the West need and are embracing it. And so it makes it more vital to us and translates it for us by seeing it in these literatures. And so it's significant. So I, I thank you for making that connection. I'm gonna to go to Av uh, Avacha in just a second, but I just wanted to ask you right quick, Hope, are there any specific writers that we should be paying closer attention to? You, you've given us Nettie Okra for especially, but are there some others that might be on your radar that should be on ours? Oh, thank you. Um, that, that anthology that you mentioned that just came out is a really great place to start. Um, and it includes uh, Okorafor's um, essay that she has on her website. I also really enjoy the work of Akwaki Amezi, who is an Igbo Tamil author, and they uh, write both young adult and adult fiction and work with African Jujuism um, and also LGBTQ themes. The hero of their last um, YA novel, Pet, is actually a young trans girl and really making that conversation inclusive. Um, I also, you know, I come back to Ovalova Gucci Amacheta, who is one of the foundational um, writers of the African literary canon. And, you know, Akorafor uh, describes Amacheta as uh, one of her influences as well. And what's interesting to me is uh, Amacheta is known primarily as a, a realistic author. Um, but, you know, I believe it was in 1981, her very last book um, that she published, The Rape of Shavi. And that is her foray into what we now are calling African futurism, where she constructs this fictional nation of Shavi um, that is, you know, a, a utopia in, in Africa, you know, where everybody is equal, where the, the lowliest child can speak to the king, you know, respect and community, these very African to, to, to essentialize very broadly um, values. And then, you know, in comes this, um, this kind of uh, white, this plane that has been captained by these um, white Europeans who that crash lands into their society and how that, you know, devastates the society. And what's interesting is that novel taps into the nuclear anxiety of the 1980s and brings an African voice into that conversation because um, the, the white Europeans who crash land into that utopian, idealistic, um, 
African society, they're, they're trying to flee because the atomic bomb is about to go off. And so they think that their only, their only um, way to avoid nuclear holocaust is to, of the world is to find a place that is, um, um, you know, away from uh, civilization. And of course, what you see is that, you know, who really is more civilized is the African nation and, and various nations. So, so I come back to the work that um, the African women writers who were writing in the 60s and 70s were doing in Buche Machete, Miriam Abba, um, Bessie Head, even though it's not considered technically African futurism, it's very compelling because they were, um, they were because they were writing feminist literature, they had to they had to imagine a space of freedom the same way that Black writers who are not um, concerned with feminist literature do, because you're trying to imagine a space free of oppression. And so they did much of this, the work. And what you see is that, um, you know, post-colonialism, the rise of the first, you know, first you have the man, you know, Achebe, Soyenka, um, in the, um, um, Yongo, and, you know, they're the first push. And then, and their writing looks very realistic. And then after that, you know, after the patriarchy, the second wave of, of literature from the content, you have the, the, the women writers. And, you know, they're playing um, with, with more, um, I don't want to say more, but a different imaginative landscape, because again, they have to, they have to imagine a, a world free of oppression, not just of race, but gender. Um, and how that plays out. Um, and I also, because it's compelling, you know, this, this imaginative space to not just, it's not just in terms of sci-fi, if we were doing that, that kind of strict definition, but the imaginative that is there in terms of alternative realities or alternative histories or the horror or, um, or you know, the fantastic magical realism um, or, the, or the kind of the blend of that that's in noir. And, you know, Helen Oyeyemi is doing, has been doing wonderful work in that scape, or Yankin Braithwaite's work, um, which is, more leans on noir but, and magical realism, but still is that kind of imaginative landscape to imagine a world that is free, of, free in some way. Um, both Chris Abani and Mazen and Jeste, um, Chris Abani being a Nigerian American writer, and Mazen and Jeste being um, an Ethiopian American writer, have put together anthologies of kind of that blur the lines between noir and magical realism in this alternative space. Um, Marlon James is, um, you know, uh, most recent novel um, speaks to this space and he brings into the conversation the kind of um, Jamaican um, uh, uh, aspect of the diaspora. And so it's such a large conversation. I, I'm i not going to talk at you forever, but it's, it's so rich and I thank you for having this conversation and um, having me be a part of it. Yes, well, thank you for joining us. What I will say, we may have gotten everything that you shared. I know that uh, several folks, especially Ayana, uh, have been trying to, you know, clue us in as well as others, but you might want to just put in the chat, you know, those authors' names that you just gave a shout out to, and that way we'll be able to each and every one of us engage them accordingly. Um, uh, I'm going to pivot. And I want to I want to thank you, Hope, for for engaging us and moving us, especially through that uh, African futurism, especially relative to the new anthology that has just come out. Uh, let me also say, within that that context, um, I've I've gotten through half of it, and it is uh, highly immersive. It is highly challenging within the context of both sometimes language but also sometimes certain aspects of the culture that's being conveyed. Uh, there, there are necessities in some regards, but that's the challenge. You know, you have to dig deep into the literature to, to, to confront these things, to come to a higher understanding and a higher consciousness. So I think it's important. And I think what you just shared with us raises the level of importance of how we engage Afrofuturism as we move on. And in, in saying that, let's move on to Avacha. Uh, Sister Avaja, you have uh, East Coast and West Coast music, East Coast, West Coast poetry, East Coast, West Coast visual art. You have been uh, at the forefront of um, visioning creativity, um, and I especially like it within the context of music uh, for you to comment on, but um, you've heard all of this discussion. Uh, we're interested in um, what you've been bringing to it and maybe uh, your own visioning, your own Afrofuturism within that larger context of uh, 
sharing how you've given us a whole palette of creativity uh, on both the East and West Coast. Well, um, what can I say? I am uh, so grateful to be on this panel with some of my heroes and, and what have you. Uh, I have been a fanatic, a fanatic, fanatic, fanatic uh, of Samuel Delaney, excuse me, Chip, uh, because I didn't know that we were called Chip until just recently. But I worshiped the man from way back when. Uh, I started as a musician. I, from the time I was a kid, I was a very weird kid for New York. And New York, you go up in the, in the city, you're supposed to be tough and all that kind of stuff. And I was a wimp. And the way, best way of getting around, getting my behind whipped every day was to hang out in libraries and keep my head buried in the music. One of the good things about being in the libraries, I read everything, especially the, the sections of the library that little kids are not supposed to be in. But I read a lot, a lot, a lot of, of artists. And to get to what, to this subject of black, uh, uh, Afrofuturism, I, I guess I would call myself more a pan-African uh, wordsmith. Uh, I believe that it's, we've always had this, this concept, we didn't call it Afrofuturism. And the people could fly, if that's not science fiction, I don't know what is. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, been, we've, been, we've, been, we've been doing this since dirt was dirty, and I'm just part of the continuum. But to get back to me, uh, when I was little in those libraries, one of the first people that jumped out of me, a black artist that blew my mind was John Tuma. I worship that man's writing and I highly recommend everybody to write, read the man, John Tuma. And then of course, Margaret Walker, who I've heard people mention to her so far on this program, um, turned my head inside out. Then there's a guy, a guy from Peru, and, and I don't know if his stuff has been translated into English, but if you, it has been, his name is Nicomedes Santa Cruz an amazing writer, and then Amos Tutuola from Africa, oh my God. Amos Tutuola, as far as I'm concerned, is the god of fantasy, Afro-fantasy. Um, those people really turned me inside out. And to be on this panel with uh, Chip is just such an honor for me because as I say, I'm, ju I'm just a, a person, uh, a kid that was very, very weird. I did not study uh, formally very much the writing, or the music. But I was raised with my mother and father with dances. I'm a theater baby. I was raised around uh, uh, artists and writers. Uh, and when I wasn't in the library, I was in the music. I was in the books and the, uh, on the foot, uh, on the stoop. I was, I, that's what I lived by. I, I don't really know much about anything else because that's what I, my, my whole life has been about. And for me, I don't want to be stuck in a box. I don't want, I think that Glenn Paris said it best, it's going to be very dangerous for people trying to limit us because whether I want to write a poem that has to do with uh, Mother Nature or if I want to write a poem about an alien coming down or one of the stories that I wrote about a, a vampire who was a germaphobe. Oh, you know, the, the poor baby's got a serious problem. <laughs> I won't be able to write where it comes to me. I believe that the ancestors are speaking to us all the time. It's written on our GNA. And when the ancestors talk to me, I write. So sometimes it comes out in some pretty fantastic things. One of the things in my book is called uh, Global, African, uh, uh, um, Global African Jazz Dance. And there's one line in it that um, I love. It talks about, uh, I was given a job to do and I landed on the road where Highland Wolf, Sun Ra, and Celia Cruz crossed paths and danced. And that's what my life is like. If the ancestors speak to me, whether it's English, Spanish, Spanglish, or Ebonics, that's the way it comes out. And so I guess that's about what I would have to say. I think that um, if people want to call what I do, science fantasy, science fiction, magical realism, uh, whatever they want to call it, just call it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> especially when it comes to getting the gigs. Oh, I see somebody is uh, commenting on Amos Tutuola. Amos Tutuola is a word god. So is John Tuma. John Tuma, I mean, these people, these people, there's so many great writers that are not given the credit. I just did the thing the other night on Pat Parker and Audrey Lord. Audrey Lord, I never knew her, but Pat Parker, I was the opening act for her for three and a half years. The woman was one of the most brilliant writers that ever existed on this planet, and most people don't know her work, and they should. The homophobes have really kind of tried to wipe her out of existence, but she's one of the finest writers that we've ever had, you know? But then we've had some great writers all along. Ishmael Reed, 
I mean, he turned, uh, he turned writing inside out. And I don't think he's given the credit he's due. So I don't know what questions you want to ask me. So I'm, I'm waiting for your questions. Yeah, yeah. I've got one more because I want to I want to get Grace in. She's our final panelist and she's, you know, she's 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 batting clean up. You know, the bases are loaded and we about to win the World Series when she steps to the plate because we already know what she's capable of doing. I mean, she's she's going to be bringing it Janelle Monet, Lovecraft Country, Fua Richardson and some more stuff. But uh, Sister Avacha, um, so Octavia Butler has embraced you in certain ways, I guess. Um, I want to, you're on the West Coast. And so this whole notion of how artists interpret the work of others, especially musicians. And so I'm just wondering, not so much how you may have interpreted Octavia's work, but how you as a musician may have been influenced or inspired by some other artists, be they visual or literary. Has that manifested itself in any way? I'm inspired by everything. I mean, there's no way on earth for anybody who's ever read Octavia Butler not to be inspired. I, what, what these other artists do, they open the door to new ways of thinking. It's like, I, as a musician, a good example, because it works the same way with writing. I'm playing a tune, and all of a sudden I make a mistake. You're on stage, you cannot stop saying, oops, wait a minute, let me find out what the right note is, let me check. The no, 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 no. You gotta find your way back to one. And in that mistake, you wind up going down new roads. Some of those new roads may have been inspired by an Octavia Butler or a Chip Delaney or, or Amos Tutola or what have you. It's written now on our genes. Once it's in there, once we hear it, it's written in our genes. And I'm not afraid to admit that I don't know it all. And some of these folks have bits of the answer that I need to get back to that one when I make that mistake. And even though I don't want to sound like them, I want to learn from them, every single one of them. And so I allow them to speak through me. And so I'm grateful for every single one of them. And I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, I'm a pivot to Grace. Uh, could we unmute her? Um, we've been going for a good solid two hours and we're going to try to go with this a little bit longer with whoever can hang when we move into some follow up this dialogue and Q and A, but Grace. Yes. You know, Back to Atlanta, um, you've contextualized and celebrated Cindy Mayweather, Janelle Monet, um, for quite some time, right? And so uh, we've been taking on quite a march with her, you know, both relative to engaging other ways of being as well as um, protests. Mm -hmm. um, what is her power source? Is it vibranium? What? <laughs> that's a that's a good one um and so atlanta used to be home for me before i moved to richmond so like i'm it's like second home for me now so uh i appreciate you know definitely bringing in atl um in that respect um you know it could be vibranium definitely the ancestors you know like when i i think about that like she is basically carrying the message that the ancestors have been constantly talking about have been constantly putting out there and so um she's never afraid of a challenge and our ancestors we know who have survived and continue to survive the fact that we bring them back up the fact that we go back to them to ask for guidance to to lead us to push us through you know that that to me is what i see is kind of like her power source mm -hmm. and so um one thing that always stuck, sticks out with me about her is she made this quote in a vanity fair article where she says i'm choosing freedom over fear and um, we talked to you, someone mentioned earlier about the liberation piece, which Yatasha Womack, you know, adds into her definition of Afrofuturism. And I truly see that that's kind of like also the fuel, the power source of um, Janelle Monae is, is freedom, liberation, you know, the, this constant, like we're running this marathon to get that, to obtain that. And so, um, yeah, you know, she is someone who I'm like, she's younger than me, but I feel like she's older, you know, so I feel like she's like the big sister, you know, that I'm like, I want you to be my friend, my family. You know, um, we both come from the Midwest, you know, her being Kansas City, I'm from Champaign, Illinois. And then, you know, we've had roots in Atlanta. So um, she's, you know, got this like strategic process in everything that she does. So, and I think that contributes to this ultimate, you know, power source that she has. Great. Right. So 
let's 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 talk graphic novels and comic books. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've got these Afrofuturist writers and illustrators. Um, I mean, I'm thinking Eve Ewing with with Ironheart, you know, the whole big advancement of the Iron Man narrative, you know, shifted for a moment with a black woman who said to be the smartest person on the planet right. uh, through that comic book series called Ironheart. Mm -hmm. Riri Williams is his name. And and then Roxane Gay and Nettie Okrafor writing within the context of those spinoffs uh, from Black Panther. Uh, right. And certainly um, Sh Shuri, who we of course know uh, will be the Black Panther in the movie, not to destroy it for those of you who haven't heard the news yet, but that's a given because that's how it was in the comic book. Yeah. And then um, uh, Afua Richardson, visual artist who actually, because this is how we'll pivot to Lovecraft Country, uh, has given us those illustrations for the uh, Orinthia Blue comic book that we see in that series. Wow. So yeah, so we've got graphic novels, comic books, this whole visual narrative that comes through as Afrofuturism. It's an exciting explosion, right? It is. And so my dissertation actually um, looks at, uh, or it looked at, so it's done as if I'm saying a dissertation life takes you out. Uh, <laughs> my dissertation was on black female superheroes in comics and graphic novels. And so I definitely um, uh, speak to Eve Ewing. I have a whole chapter on the Dora Milaje and particularly specifically looking at Roxane Gay and Nettie Corfor and Afua Richardson's work and contribution to continuing the story of the Dora Milaje. And so mm -hmm. um, Afrofuturism in comics for me is always like, it's, it's been a relationship. You know, a lot of people are kind of beginning to talk about the connection between the two, but it's always been there. And even before many of the people that you mentioned, um, I look at, you know, obviously X-Men's Storm and with her ability to manipulate the weather and, you know, control the atmosphere. Um, you have Misty Knight who has a bionic arm. You know, um, you have uh, Vixen who, you know, uh, trades the line with African mysticism. You have uh, the Milestone comics, which definitely uh, tap into, you know, this Midwestern fantasy city of Dakota. And then you have uh, several of the uh, Tex Hardware, uh, Blood Syndicate, uh, Static Shock. And so these are all that really tap into the technology piece of Afrofuturism as well. And, um, and you know, just the fact that you have all of these stories and narratives that have been told through the fictional lens of comics and graphic novels that, you know, steps into this fantasy, but also interprets a reality that mm -hmm. Afrofuturism does and, and, and definitely speaks to. And um, I would even, going back to the people that you mentioned, like this whole idea that this new wave of comics, particularly of Black characters, definitely has been ushered or, or is, is brought in by Black women, Black women and Black women of the diaspora. So the fact that you have someone like Eve Ewing writing about a Black teen from her hometown of Chicago, you have Roxane Gay, who is talking about, you know, Black queer stories with the Dora Milaje and the Black, Future, uh, Pan excuse me, Black uh, Panther Water Wakanda series. You have Nettie Okorafor, who also uh, takes another uh, lens with looking at the Dora Milaje and, and, and looking at it from various different lenses. And so these are, you know, Black women who are taking up the lead with comics. And oftentimes, Black women barely even had a role in comics. We were actually seen as like, oh, no, we don't exist. We're not, you know, we're not, we're not visible. We're marginalized. But now they're writers, they're artists, pencilers, you know, everything. And so um, the fact that they're envisioning and actually putting pen to paper, color to paper, um, is really actually quite exciting um, as well. And so, and yeah, definitely with the Fool Richardson, her artistic contribution on this wide, big screen level um, has been quite amazing too. And she's definitely done a lot of work with Marvel um, in the past and continues to do so. Um, but definitely, I think this work with Lovecraft really, you know, puts his, put, sets her up another notch again to basically say, you need to see who this is, know who a fool Richardson is, know her work and, um, and know what she brings to the table. Yeah. I think it's important to note that because she did this work with Lovecraft Country, I'm, I'm waiting for the actual hard copy of the Arithia Blue comic book from, from Lovecraft Country. 
But the fact that the narrative is, situates itself around a young girl who is a comic, who is an illustrator, a comic illustrator that tells this story that then her mother embraces that character because it is her mother. She puts her mother out on that adventure and what happens? You know, she, she goes through the portal of space and time and, be a, and is able to actually go through those adventures in ways that are highly revealing within driving the narrative of uh, Lovecraft Country itself. Um, there's a lot to be said about Lovecraft Country, and I'm sure there's some aspects of it that resonate with you relative to Black women's yeah. superheroes ad infinitum. For sure. And just a real quick touch on with Afrofuturism and, and excuse me, um, a poor Richardson and Lovecraft. She tweeted out when they mentioned her name. So, you know, when Hi uh, Hippolyta mentions, you know, an artist named A Fool who taught me mm -hmm. so much glee because um, she says, you know, as an artist, um, the fact that being mentioned in the series was not only freaking amazing, it was so much to explain. Her father, who had been denied an art scholarship in the 60s, being able to see this moment and share it was such a proud moment. So the fact that, you know, she gets to kind of carry a legacy that was not given to her, her father and it's actually been able to be vocalized, I think is, is, is quite amazing and, um, and, and worth noting um, as well too. And so um, honestly for me, Lovecraft was like, it filled a gap for my summer fall television. You know, mm -hmm. with, the, with the pandemic, there's been a lot of, you know, television hasn't been what it, it you know, it's, it's been used to be. So um, it definitely filled that summer fall television lineup for me. And so immediately after the first episode, it was like evident. I was like, okay, we, we're definitely dealing with Afrofuturism here. We're definitely dealing with the Black Futures. We're definitely dealing with the comics and so forth. You know, I was like, it was continuing as um, Ayanna said, you know, what Watchmen I feel like had did. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, so you're dealing with supernatural horror. You're dealing with magic realism. You're dealing with fantasy. And, um, you know, it was bringing in dialogues past, present, and future. And, you know, where it was uh, dealing, it was showcasing Chicago, which I definitely see as a very Afrofuturistic city, you know, um, in, you know, the 50s and dealing what's going on at the time with redlining and, um, and people trying to figure out their identities of what's going on in the world and in society. So um, to me, I saw Lovecraft Country also as like a, a revamped history class mm -hmm. uh, that we were in, we got to specifically look at Black events you know, um, that happened, particularly, obviously, in the, the United States. But it was through this sci-fi horror lens. So, you know, we see um, nods to Jackie Robinson. We see nods to the Negro Motorist Green Book. We see Emmett Till. We see the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. We see Jim Mark Vesey. Um, and so these are all events that actually happened, but they're, you know, it's like a twisted lens of, of, um, of a fantasy that is kind of attached to it, but then it's also exposing what a lot of this current, the current horrors that we were dealing with and living with. And so um, I, I really appreciated, you know, learning stuff, revisiting things uh, through uh, each episode, you know, um, and also the ways in which it did not disrespect, as Hope was talking about, um, spirituality, African spirituality and religion. You know, there was definitely blending that. If you know, if you all remember the Holy Ghost episode, uh, which is pretty much kind of like definitely one of my favorite episodes to date. So, um, you know, it's confronting past and present traumas from different vantage points. It's reformulating who gets to be in the lab, in the science lab. So you got somebody like Hippolyta who transforms this idea that black women can be science and that they are there and they exist. And it's kind of like, no, no her. And, um, even though Atticus is the main character, it was as though the women kind of were still, you know, making sure to um, push the show forward and move the show forward. So um, for me, that's definitely was a, a, an inspiring thing as a black woman who's interested in comics and interested in graphic novels in, in the future, seeing kind of black women at the helm was really in inspiring. Cool. Well, we've covered quite a bit of terrain. <laughs> we've, we've covered it with <laughs> some very powerful and important personalities and creative intellectuals um, to advance our understanding of the terms Afrofuturism and Black speculative arts, um, to advance our understandings of history, of culture, 
uh, the African diaspora, if you will, black creativity, uh, black genius. And I want to shout out to black genius as an operative uh, initiative right here in North Carolina. Um, and I also want to point out that there are many friends and faces that I see out there. I want to give you know, our panelists a few other things to say if they want, but I'm going to have Chris just open up the unmute everything. And uh, Joyce, did you want to say something right quick? Okay. Good seeing you. Good seeing you. But I want to say, do any of our panelists want to give some sort of follow-up commentary on anything that we've heard uh, right quick? Um, I'm we'll scared, start. Daryl. Yep. We'll yep. start with you, Chip. Go ahead. Okay, okay. Something, something very, very quick, I hope. And, uh, um, um, I have an African friend. His name is Nihaya Mabutu, and he's a young man to me. He's, um, which is to say he's in his probably late 30s, possibly early 40s. Um, and he sent me a story to read. Okay, hold that in there, Heather. I'm sitting there with a story of his. Recently, I was looking, okay, recently I was looking at a volume of Vladimir Nabokov's novels. And I was looking at the novel Pneen. And I realized that Going through it, there was something that the two of them had in common. And this is what the two of them had in common. Nowhere in Nabokov's novel was there a mention of the color of, of any of the characters' skin. And in Nihaya's story, written in Kenya, in this small town outside of uh, Nairobi, um, there is no mention, it's a science fiction story, and there's no mention of the color of anyone's skin. Uh, it's a future story. So if you read the two of them, both of the uh, story is definitely science fiction, but I wonder what that means. Just some, think about that. And one of the things I said, one of the things in the, I, when I wrote him back, I said, one of the things I have to tell you about your story is that no one would reading it, and it was written in English, uh, very good English, because I met him first at Dartmouth, where he was a student. Uh, I said, the one thing, no one will know that you're writing about Africans. Hmm. Yeah. And which is to say, if, if you're reading, if you're reading Nabokov in Africa, he could, you know, the names are Russian, you know, so you know, that. but, you know, if you, just in terms of the physical descriptions of the people, you know, um, maybe the fathers were Russian and the mothers were black. You don't, there's no way to know. And I just think that's something interesting to bear in mind. And I'll show, that's my, my, my. Abacha and then Glenn. Uh, what I wanted to say is that, uh, as I said earlier, I believe in ancestral memory. And according to science, the man science and their DNA stuff that they do with their cloning, et cetera, everything that we've ever been is written on our genes. So this is speaking to us all. Everybody has had an opinion where something comes up, you don't know where the heck it came from. I say the same ancestors speaking. And they, I'm very grateful to say they've spoken to me a lot. When I was a kid, I was called crazy for saying things like that. But it's made me a good writer. I think it's made people like Chip Delaney a very good writer and what have you. And I would like to say to any young writers out there, when it happens to you, when those ancestors are speaking, don't think you're nuts. Let them speak and help you be a better creative person. Thank you. Glenn. Hey, Daryl. So one of the things that I'm um, uh, acutely aware of is Nettie Okor, for, for example, um, uh, distinction between Afrofuturism and African futurism. One of the things that I think is lost to the community in general and often to the West African community is that uh, African Americans represent about 40 million Americans. That's, that's really a nation within a nation. 40 million Americans who have no history. We've lost our language. We've lost our heritage in terms of who our fathers were and our ancestors were. Okay. Uh, and we're living essentially in a post-apocalyptic um, political situation. So what we've had to do as creators is fill that gap 
and we fill that gap with a culture that we have actually recreated from scratch. Whether it's cooking, whether it's music, whether it's dance, whether it's um, uh, relationships, whether it's politics or any, everything that we are, we have really recreated that from scratch from the time of slavery, when we were ripped apart. When, when uh, folks from West Africa look at us, sometimes they see somebody looks like them, but the connection is not there. It's been said by, by um, uh, folks from the continent that there are no black people in Africa. Okay, and, and it's, a, it's an astounding uh, gut punch to hear that. When you're from there, you're Igbo, you're, you're, you're Yoruba, you're Ashanti, you know, you're, you're, you're of the, the culture that you come from. And they don't identify by the skin. That's a very Western recent construct. So mm -hmm. what, what we as, as Afrofuturists, African futurists have done is we have bridged a gap that is 400 years old in some cases. And we've, we've created a culture within the span of just 200 years, because that, it took a while to deconstruct uh, mm -hmm. cultures. It, it, we've, in 200 years, we have literally built a rich culture that is recognized for its richness worldwide. So- Well, we, I got to I have to take a, I'm gonna have to take a, take an issue with that, Glenn, because I think when you first mentioned the food, uh -huh. the fact that many of our food ways, especially me being here in the South and you're in the South, some of those very self-same food ways have their origins on the continent. So I don't necessarily buy the notion that our culture has been stripped away from us. I think they, aspects of that culture retain themselves in our oh. music. They retain themselves in our storytelling traditions. As, as they as retain said, I think I think some of oh, some hold of on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I listen. I listen, and I think that there is clearly there are those who will argue this back and forth. So it's not going to be resolved within our discussion. But I think there are clearly examples of the retention of aspects of who we were. If you want to talk about a we culturally. And then there are other uh, aspects to what you stated about, you know, if you will, Africans, West Africans on the continent. Even that argument plays itself out there because there are clearly those there who clearly know the connections and everything. Next week, I engage in a discussion with my students in my science, tech, and society class built around the whole notion of um, African ancestry and DNA testing. Um, which brings the science into the discussion. Now, am I a total advocate of that whole thing? I think there's a certain level of uh, rebuilding, and it gets back to what you were just saying, rebuilding one's connection to yeah. the past. Yeah. And so yeah. I think so, that that, that I, in and of itself has, skip to the end has of my, my, my little diatribe. So one of the things that, that um, I do, and I think that many uh, African American creators do is we do reach back into something that we don't completely understand. When I wrote uh, some of my my uh, stories, I reach back and I create names. I thought I was creating names, but as I did research on them, I find that you know they're, they're, these names actually do have connections in African history and African lore, and uh, they are real. I thought I was just making that's memory. I'm sorry. No, Avacha's genetic memory. She, yes, she, I agree. Ancestral that's memory. It. That, that's it. That, that, which is a name to what I, I was feeling. Which is where I think it's important to, to realize those connections. But I want to just let uh, any of the other panelists weigh in. Um, if there is, or if not, then I want to go to, um, okay, Eugene. Well, I want to, yeah. I just wanted to thank everybody for, for this incredible, um, what was it, the, the, the spiritual, pedagogical, cultural, linguistic, musical, graphic tour <laughs> yes, uh, yes. across the African continuum. Uh, in, in particular, you know, people that I know, Avacha, and you, Daryl, of course, we go back. Uh, uh, close 
well, let's say several decades. And His Excellency uh, Samuel Delaney, whom I met at both the National Black Writers uh, Conferences in, uh, in Brooklyn and at the National Black Arts Festival in Atlanta. And they both came into being um, in the 80s. So I want, I mean, some of the names I've heard, some people I, I didn't know before this evening or before I started reading about the cadre that was, that would be part of the Zoom this evening. Um, I do want to say that um, this, this idea of the continuum is self-definitionally endless and into perpetuity so that we, 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 we have our works cut out for us. Um, and my approach, I was in the classroom for 45 years, and my approach uh, has always been thanks to the ancestors and all the teachers, including former students of mine, many of whom I'm in touch with here 50 years, 50 some odd years after we worked together. I, uh, my, because of all that, my approach has been from freedom to freedom. And I'm listening from freedom to freedom, not slavery to freedom. We uh, went to John Hope Franklin and said, brother, you are a genius. But this was 60. <laughs> You're a genius, but we can't, we can't deal with slavery to freedom. It's got to be freedom to freedom. And where we are now, I've done over 60 Zooms and twice that number of telephone conferences, seminars, and so on. And corporation executives, uh, uh, superintendents of schools, chancellors and presidents who know or heard about our work in setting up Black Studies programs and other um, ethnic studies units say, are saying to the team that I work with and I, we need you. And we start out by saying, when they say we want to get back to normal, and I say normal is what got us here. <laughs> <laughs> Just that. So if that's what you're looking for, it ain't here. Okay. Now, so, uh, you know, I'm going to probably be 80, 83 in some days. And uh, so all that we've talked about and all that we've come out of um, that's pretty familiar to me. I mean, what, what we did when we went from classes, first time somebody said, come on campus and teach blackness, my mouth just fell open. <laughs> what? I knew Negro, a little Negro history. We had a Negro history week until the 70s, Black History Month. I, re I could I could recite Paul on Dunbar and and some of Hughes and Jane Well and Johnson today at a funeral or at some event. I look around to see who has to read the back of the obituary to sing Left Every Voice and Sing. Because you were considered illiterate if you didn't know it by heart when I was a kid and my posse, right? So we, uh, so there is this shifting, you know, this, this uh, conveyor belt or this turnstile. And uh, I'm, I'm just happy. This is the basis, this, 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 this Zoom and others that uh, the great Kim McMillan has put together. They're the basis of the new university. I mean, this, this is, this evening, it was the University of the African Continuum, 
whether their names, like Henry Dumas' name, you can't tell he's a black writer by his name, by the names of his stories. I mean, here, one of the blackest of our writers. And you can't really tell from Archer Bones or John Noah and the Green Stone or Poetry for My People or, uh, uh, you know, just name any one of the stories, any one of the collections of, of the novel. And you can't really tell the same thing with, uh, with uh, Samuel Delaney and some others, uh, works by people who are uh, uh, on this panel, part of this Zoom this evening. So I just wanted to thank you so much. I've learned learned a lot. Uh, I mean, it's incredible. To see Daryl when he was moving around and finding his place and to hear this, this eloquent um, professor <laughs> <laughs> intertwined, intertwined science and uh, the funky eloquence of the blues. Uh, I mean, it's, that's my reward. You all are my reward, I know. And uh, thank you so much uh, for it, for the younger people who are dynamite, <laughs> dying old mate. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we're still on, on the path of uh, waking up the lost, as we used to say on the corners uh, in East St. Louis and Chicago and Cleveland in the 60s, come in the consciousness, brothers. Come in the consciousness, Susan, uh, sisters. Please come in the consciousness. That's how it all, that's how we all started it. And I tell people tell me 30, 40, 50, 60 years later, man, I hated you. Talk about coming <laughs> in the consciousness. I figured, well, if you just got your, you got your wits about you and and you you uh and you you committed you could do it he said but you you people were right it was more than that it was more than just going to work every day and trying to be twice as good as white people they had the background this is a janitor who was at a school he said i hated you brother every time i had to set up that all-purpose room for the 300 kids I said, he said, oh, shit, here's Redmond coming again with it, coming again with his shit, you know? And he said, I, I it was a, a retired janitor, met him in a fast food place. <laughs> and he, he said, but yeah, he said, you all were right. There's more to it than just being twice as good as white people. We got, we got a history that we need to embrace. And we sat there and cried together across that table and uh, place, place to take it on, little brother, little sister, take it on, carry it on, B.B. King. <laughs> oh, but thank, thank you all, and Dale, especially you and Kim, everybody here. I, this, is, this has been a real cram course for me, at least 400 years. <laughs> well, thank not you. To mention, not to mention Moreau, pre Egypt, Kush, and so on. That's what we say. Until, until the civilizations can face each other as civilizations, then this won't be solved. There won't be any solving to it until you can bring a civilization and in our think tanks and in our. Uh, Zoom would say, um, what you need is to bring that, bring Murrow and bring Kush and bring pre-Egyptian thought. Uh, and then we stand, because every culture has been devastated and every culture has devastated another one. Mm -hmm. Every culture has had a great past and given something to the world, and every culture has been knocked down, all the way down, and knocked other cultures down. Now that's that. That's uh, how we approach it. You know, coming out of the '60s, coming out of the '40s, coming out of the Negro academies of the late uh, 1800s. You know, that's that's how we we confront it, and we have gotten there. 
and then we have uh, uh, slip back on this treadmill and in this turnstile. And it looks like it looks like we have the opportunity now. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. It looks like we have the opportunity to take it on, you know, take it on to the goal line. Uh, thank you. Love you all. I love you too, Eugene. Thank you. Um, let me say this to my panelists, Avacha, Grace Gibson, um, Glenn Paris, Chip Delaney, uh, uh, Hope uh, Kabuki, Ayana Jameson. Um, I want to thank you for delivering this, especially to the world. It will be available uh, online so you can share it with others. Uh, it's been a wonderful evening. There is one more part in this series that is uh, in December, two days after my birthday, mind you, <laughs> on December 13th, uh, 2 p.m. Pacific time, uh, 5 p.m. on the East Coast where I exist. Uh, but it will be uh, a Afrofuturistic poetry reading. Uh, mm -hmm. It will be curated by Kim. So uh, those mm -hmm. folks need to make sure if you're listening, make sure you got your poetry to her so she can take a look. Uh, and that should be a wonderful excursion and expression of uh, creative productivity uh, within the context of uh, how we'll move forward now. I believe everything's gonna be unmuted and if people wanna just say hi and bye, I'm gonna say bye, cause I got quite a bit to take care of. I got about 60 papers I have to read and grade. Uh, <laughs> I also got to <laughs> I got it too. <laughs> and so I am going to on my departure, but it's good seeing some of your faces that I know. And it's especially wonderful to have seen you, Eugene. Uh, Otis is smiling. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, Otis is smiling. <laughs> uh, what I want to say real quick is... Uh, Blue-zition. I don't know why mine isn't... Uh, oh. um, anyway, it's Avacha. Uh, one of the things I want to say on that, on the, in answer to what Ben was talking about, I remember I, I'm a blues nut among other... I like, I like traditional musics. And I was in Mississippi, went down for one of the blues festivals, and, uh, and I okay, okay, I, I miss miss, but I was down in Mississippi, and I was going to a blues festival, and the great Mississippi Fred McDowell was there. I had a, a cassette player, and I was playing Thelonious Monk, and he said they're playing our music. You know what we've been conditioned. People have told us that we came here and we were white, clean slates. That is the biggest crock and you know what. I'm not even going to all the detail on that. We were not. Our things have carried over. The blues is one of them. Go to the music of Mali. Ah, 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 ah. Straight out of Mali. Okay. The, the, the Juba. There's no dance company in the world that does not, especially black dance companies or musicians, does not know. I mean, Yusuf Latif is a beautiful tune, Juba. In whether it's Dominica, Ecuador, Cuba, Puerto Rico, everybody knows Juba. We call it Juba, you call it Juba. It's straight out of Africa. We still have cultural memory. We still are African people. We may have been diluted a little taste, which is why we have languages like Ebonics or Spanglish or what have you to make up sounds that to replace things, concepts that have been supposedly wiped from us. We don't have a word for it. So we make up these other sounds like good, 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 You know what I'm talking about. Oh, Wanda, good, 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 I sure love that dress you got on. You know what I'm talking about. But that's the way we, we transfer our traditions. We came with something. We were not empty slates. We are not empty slates. And I will say that forever. So anyway, enough for me. And anyone want to say anything? Feel free to. Yeah, yeah, thank I, you very much. Yeah. I enjoyed this. It was fascinating. I learned a lot, and now I'm looking up at the futurism. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank, thank you. you, Kim. This is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> just giving thanks. I'm just giving thanks. Thank you. Uh, hey, Kim. I wanted, I want, I'd like to throw in one little last thing. 
Um, uh, some of you may not know, my grandfather was a slave in this country. Not my great-grandfather, but my grandfather. Uh, and, uh, pardon me? Yeah, and so I think it's just interesting to see, you know, see, you know, uh, I don't think they're going to be, I think probably we'll you know, there are not going to be too many people who are that closely connected to slavery. Uh, most people can remember their grandfathers. I never met my grandfather who was a slave. He did die before I was born, but I met my, certainly met my other grandfather who was the great grand, who was a, his, his father had been a slave. Uh, but I think, uh, and I, I, this is the way I always used, whenever I would give talks, I would always uh, to especially to black students and what have you in black students groups. That's the way I would always begin it because I think it's important to realize that we are not that far from actual slavery. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Tim. Mm. Okay. That's it. <laughs> My name is Troy. And, uh, here I'm with Miami International Science Fiction Film Festival. And I want to thank Kim for inviting me. Um, it's been a very interesting and informative event. Um, I'm a huge fan of Afrofuturism, if you've seen some of the films that we play. So if you guys have any films or screenplays, we'd love to, uh, love to check them out. Thanks, Troy. <laughs> Thank you, Troy. Anyone else before we go? Does anyone... I just want to say thank you so much. I never would have dreamed that I could see Samuel Delaney, who I love, and Avata, who I love and know in person. And I'm a black queer poet, and I um, I grew up with this science fiction stuff, but I thought I was alone. Like most people I know don't even read books, let alone right. anything Afrofuturistic. So this has been a total thrill. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Yeva. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to everybody out there in the audience and all the panelists who participated. This is phenomenal. This is great. Um, I look forward to uh, future conversations. And uh, I'm really looking forward to that reading list. <laughs> yeah. so hopefully you can put something well, together. I, I'll put the reading list out. It's so rapid fire. You know, um, I, I'd love to get a, a list of a lot of these citations uh, that were mentioned by all the different panelists. I will have the reading list by probably Monday at tomorrow at the latest. So, so, of course. And I'll send it out to anyone who left me their email address. Cool. <laughs> yeah, Miss Clapping. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. You always bring me together, not only with your beauty, but the beauty of, I mean, do you know how many years I have worshipped Samuel Delaney? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> on a panel with I, somebody almost God status, and I actually on a panel with this guy in Glenn Paris, who I'm lucky enough to have met through you. I mean, what can I say? All these wonderful people. I'm in seventh heaven. I'm feeling almost like a movie star. In fact, I'm going to get up, go to the mirror, and kiss myself. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Devor. By the way, Devor will be on the, one of the readers, uh, poets, on December 13th at 2 p.m., as well as Avacha, Glenn, and several other people here at uh, Ishmael Reed. It's going to, we're going to have quite a, uh, a brilliant group of poets. So please keep on sticking with us. We're going to come to the end of this series, but it's been a real honor. And um, I appreciate, Chip, that you mentioned that your grandfather was a slave because we think that it's so far away from us, but it really isn't. And it is in our DNA, whether we like it or not. It's a part of our history and it affects our work. And we have to realize that and, and I'll just allow, allow it because we're, we're on a, you know, we're growing. We're growing and we're, we're doing things that help us and help the world. I think when one person gets happy, one person feels better, one person is healed or comes to terms with their life or who they are, they help the planet, each person, you know? So, okay guys, unless anyone has anything left to say, we're, we're going home.